What's up, guys? It's your boy, Omni Sensei. Welcome to What If the Bijou Adopted an Atsutsuki Baby? Part 2. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. Tenken, do you think we can beat him? Shuriken asked his sword. The old snake had calmed down a lot during the time they trained. I don't know, Shiro. He feels monstrous to me. Makes me feel he can destroy my blade with a touch. Tenken replied. Shuriken sighed. He had not predicted this. He didn't even know who this person was. So he asked, Who are you? And what are you even talking about? What source? Haha, <laughs> so you don't remember anything? I am Minashiki Atsutsuki, one of the many gods of the universe, who rules everything. This small planet is nothing for us. Destroying it is as easy as stomping on it. But we don't do that because something valuable grows here. Shuriken gasped, God tree? So you do know something, but I am not here for the tree. I am here for you. You are far more valuable than a simple tree or a fruit. Minashiki devilishly said. His voice only had contempt and bloodlust. So he's not after my family. If I can stop him, they can all leave safely, he realized. Now he had decided. He was going to fight this being no matter what. Oh, do you want to fight me? Haha, <laughs> you may be better than most of the pests on this planet, but you still remain a pest. Let's see, I'll call you the king of pests. Minashiki laughingly said. He was taunting Shuriken, so he would move first. But Shuriken was taught better than that and did not move. Do you know who my real parents are? Shuriken asked, thinking this person might know about his past. Minashiki started laughing as if he had heard the biggest joke. Haha, parents? Your? No, we made you... Pest King, you are a lab experiment. Shuriken was saddened, but he felt this was a lie. If he was a lab experiment, how did he escape while being a baby? Why can't he remember anything from that time? There was surely more to it than what met the eye. TSK, I'm getting impatient, let's end this now. Minashiki declared, ZZZ. Shuriken didn't even notice and Minashiki was gone, having disappeared from his place. Nervously, he looked around himself. There was no sign of him, but he remained vigilant, trying to anticipate any movement. Bam, he had ignored the above. A portal-like thing appeared, and from inside an arm punched Shuriken's head. It was very heavy, and meant to kill him in one strike. Shuriken immediately used his arms to lessen the impact, but it still hurt him a lot, turning one of his arms into a paste. He was in pain now, but he used his other arm to try to push him away. Eh, hey, hey. Amusing. The fact you did not die sets you above most of the mortal beings I have fought. Minashiki praised him with an annoying smile on his face. Shuriken staggered under the weight of his punch. I need to get out of this situation or else my body will break. Shuriken opened his mouth and did something Kurama had proudly taught him. The Bijadama. He looked up at Minashiki. His mouth started to gather natural energy from around there. Normal Bijadama was made of an 8 to 2 ratio of positive black chakra and negative white chakra. But Shuriken was different. He was a being made of natural energy. For the most part, the tailed beasts thought Shuriken was just made of chakra. So they tried to teach him their version of Bijadama. But since it was found out that he was not made of chakra, but rather made of natural energy, his method changed. Now, what he gathered on his mouth was pure white natural energy, and it creates a blast many times bigger than normal Bijadama. His was now called Shirodama. What is this? 
Never seen anything like this before. Minashiki was amused by this strange ball. He was of course well versed with natural energy, but he had never seen something this pure. Even the god tree beasts were not this pure. A little more, I need to make this count, Shuriken thought, and prayed that Minashiki would not do anything until then. Hey, if you think that's going to hurt me, boom! Overconfidence, Shuriken shot the ball at him at lightning speed. Minashiki was sent many kilometers back with the energy ball and soon, the blast sounded. A blinding white light covered everything, from the sky to the land. Everything seemed as if it had lost color, and now it was all black and white world. The blast was so giant that it split the clouds above Earth. The sound only came a second later. It was ear-shattering, and along with it came strong winds that would put even the strongest storms to shame. The trees, the ground, the mountains, everything got uprooted, immediately turning the place into a wasteland. Fwa, bum. The sound of whistling wind and the echo of the loud blast still lingering around made the atmosphere seem depressing. Shuriken knew this was his chance. He quickly found a still fine tree a distance away and put his unbroken hand on it. Then he started doing the reverse of what he did while healing people. He started taking away natural energy from it. He repeated it with a few more trees, and while doing so, slowly his shattered arm was healing automatically. But there was one extra advantage Shuriken had that nobody else did. He did not have blood in his body. He had used his own body's natural energy too. An explosion of this size was the result of this. If he had tried to gather the energy from the air, it would have taken him days. But he had used a lot of his own, which now made him feel tired. He was panting, trying to breathe in the energy from the remaining trees around him. He turned his head to look at where Minashiki had fallen. I hope this did some damage to him. Kanahagakur, Tobarama stood in front of the window of Hokage office. He was looking at the developing village. Every month a new big building would rise and change the scenery. He wanted to remember it all. I wonder if Hashirama was able to gather all of the beasts. A.H. What's that? The sky turned white as if the sun was exploding. Dread and anxiety took over the hearts and minds of everyone in the village, including Tobarama. Boom! Crash, then the loud booming sound came. All the glass windows in the entire village shattered. The strong winds then made many small shanties blow away. The elderly and kids fell down on the streets, unable to balance themselves. After a whole two minutes that felt like an eternity, the eye-piercing light faded, but the booming sound still lingered. Seal the whole village, send all ninjas to help the people, and send Hiruzen and the team there to see what it was. He ordered. He was still looking outside and hoped his brother was safe. In reality, the same was the case in all other nations and shinobi villages, though not as destructive as in the Country of Fire. Ten kilometers from where Shuriken fought, Hashirama, in all his battle gear, was heading towards the place he doubted to be the home of Bijou. He had not activated his sage mode, yet as it was heavy on the body and would be needed later. Boom! Just then he also faced the same things as Shuriken. He immediately stopped and punched on the ground, digging a hole for himself to jump in. Then he used a wood release to cover the top. He was very much experienced in dealing with Bijadama, and what he just saw was many times crazier than that. His mind was going insane, running every possibility. Who could it be? Nine Tails is the strongest. It cannot be other beasts. He wondered about its origin and waited for the storm outside to weaken first. Dama Village. The village was about 50 kilometers away from where Shuriken was fighting. As soon as the loud boom sounded and the storm came, all the homes in the village got destroyed. But Minari had already reached and had evacuated everyone out of their homes. All the tail beasts shielded the villagers from the effects of the blast. Shiru. 
Saiken shouted in worry. We need to go there. We need to help him. Son Goku spoke. I agree. I cannot imagine what could have caused Shiro to throw such a powerful Bijidama. If what Minari said is right, it's the Atsutsuki. Gyuki noted. I agree, let's go and help him, Matatabi added. Chomei was ready to fly. Whoever dares to mess with Shiro will get my punch. Nobody gets to hurt my child. Chomei was the one who had adopted Shuriken before anybody. He loved the boy as a parent. I will go too. Minari jumped between them. You are underestimating the powers of an Atsutsuki child. Kokuo warned her. She activated her Mangekyo. I may be weak, but not with this. They looked at each other and nodded. Fine then, let's go. Minari looked back at her husband, Jean. I will return, I promise. Please, take all the villagers away from here. As far as you can. I will come with you too. Jean requested impatiently. Minari quickly hugged him with a sad face. Please don't. You are not a shinobi. Without chakra, you will only have your own body. And do you think you can survive what you just saw? Jin's face fell. He was once again facing reality. No matter how much he trained, he can't be equal to a shinobi. He clenched his fist. Fine, I will protect the villagers. Bring back, Shiro. He kissed her and left with all the villagers. Thankfully, everyone was physically enhanced, so their speed was good. With nothing holding them back, all tailed beasts ran full speed toward Shuriken, destroying everything that came in their path. Back in the wasteland, the dust was finally starting to settle. A coughing sound was coming from the middle. Shuriken looked closely at it to see how much damage he had done, but... When he clearly saw it, his heart sank. He expected some deformation in the body, but there was nothing, except for a small drop of red blood, oozing from the nose. Minashiki seethed in rage. This was the first time in many millennia that he was bleeding. You pest. You made me bleed? Me. Shuriken looked calm. He has a god complex, he's angry. I need to persevere as much as possible to find chances to strike him good. Whoosh. Shuriken sidestepped instinctively in a split second. A dark, endless abyss formed where he stood just a second ago. It was a portal to God knows where. Shuriken's face tightened as he felt he lacked one thing right now. I wish I could fly. Shuriken tried to keep as much distance from Minashiki as possible already knowing that a physical fight was out of the options. There is no way to run. Only death awaits you. I love my life too much to give up so easily. Stop speaking and fight. Shuriken taunted him back. Zizizi, another portal appeared where Shuriken stood. It was very unnerving. He was trying his best to avoid falling into them. He didn't have any need to make hand seals. He just needs to understand the basic structure of nature and the different combinations of elements that would itself produce whatever he wanted, be it water, fire, or air. He ran at full speed, circling around Minashiki. At the same time, he threw fireballs at him to disrupt his vision. Wood entrapment. He used his natural energy to make the various left-out roots in the ground grow at a fastened pace. They pierced off the ground and caught hold of Minashiki, dragging him down in surprise. Slash, Minashiki somehow grew his horn bigger and then snapped it with his hand, making it a sword for himself. He quickly cut the tree roots. Nothing will work on me. You have tried your best. Now it's my turn, Minashiki scornfully said and raised his hand towards Shuriken. Shuriken just noticed something different in Minashiki's eyes. They didn't look like they did before with enlarged white irises with no distinguished pupils. It now had a bluish texture with a blue pupil, around which lotus patterns shining yellowish curved lines were present. A.H. The next moment Shuriken found his body being pulled towards Minashiki's arm. He quickly pulled a tree root from underground and grabbed it. But the next moment, a whole chunk of the ground started to chip off and get pulled. No matter what a shuriken tried, he was getting pulled in. He tried countless attacks, but nothing stopped it. 
Boom, from a different side. Seven black, Bijadama flew and hit Minashiki. The blast was huge, but it happened in the air this time as Minashiki was flying. It was not as strong as Shuriken's attack, but it did manage to free him from the pull. He landed on the ground and looked back. All the seven Bijou and Minari were here. He looked at them angrily and nervously. Why did you come here? Leave quickly. That Hashirama will be here soon. And if I am fighting this one, I can't stop Hashirama. Don't worry, we will help you stop them all. Saiken said resolutely. Yes, we are family. Chome landed near him. Shuriken became silent. His heart was feeling warm, but the sense of urgency grew even more. To his understanding, this Minashiki is the most dangerous being right now. If he can't deal with him, it doesn't matter if Hashirama does anything or not. Okay then, let's beat him up first. He turned back to look at Minashiki. As expected, he was not hurt much. Except throwing him around, Bijadama does nothing. Have you seen those eyes before? Shuriken asked the tailed beasts. Yuki looked at their enemy intently and remembered something. I think I did see it. It's called T-10 Segan. It grants improved strength and speed, along with the power to pull or push anything. Now it became clear to Shuriken what had happened before. It was the ability of his eyes. Be careful. He can pull us towards him. No matter what you do, do not get caught in a physical brawl. He warned them. Meanwhile, Minashiki was looking at the tailed beast, as if they were some tasty food. I sense the god tree in them. This planet is so amusing. I must bring my brothers here later to study it. He thought. Whoosh. All of a sudden, a stream of lava fell on him. It came from Sun, Goku's mouth. Seeing so many opponents, Minashiki decided to get close to them and beat them one by one. He disappeared in an instant. Be careful. He can come out from anywhere. Shuriken warned. Triple A. Saiken was thrown into the air all of a sudden. Minashiki appeared out of the ground underneath him. Shuriken, with a change of tactic, ran towards him, hoping that his natural chakra would mask him. To make it more confusing, he was constantly releasing the natural energy from his body and sending it to the trees around them. All the tailed beasts took Minashiki in a direct fight, punching, lava, air, water, fire. All kinds of attacks were being thrown at him. Minari was a distance away. From there, she activated her Mangekyo and sent the white energy beam attack. Amiai no Hikari translates to Light of Doom. Swoosh. The white blinding beam flew at the speed of light and hit Minashiki. It was strong enough to make Shuriken feel hot, so it should do some damage to him too. Bang, Minashiki tried to block it. It looked like he was going to deal with it easily too. Everyone looked at it nervously, hoping that there must be a way to harm him after all. But Shuriken didn't stop planning during this. He tried to slowly get behind Minashiki, so he can perform one attack that might scare him at least. Minashiki had finally started to feel this concentrated white energy beam. He was feeling a slight ting of pain after so long. This is annoying. He clenched his teeth. He was continuously being pushed backwards, while his arms now started to emit steam, showing that he was indeed getting damaged from this. What a waste! He muttered, and once again used his teleportation power. This was a power that required a lot of energy, even for a being of his standard. He didn't want to use it so pointlessly right now, but he had no choice. But just as he was about to cross over into the portal, out of nowhere a few wooden branches came out and grabbed him. These branches were not normal ones. They were much stronger. Wood release. Great forest technique allowed. Mature voice resounded, and a man came out of nowhere in his red armor. Hashirama! Shuriken, of course, recognized him. But to him, this was an even bigger headache. Haven't I seen you before? Oh, back at my village. Hashirama recognized Shuriken. He also looked around at the various tailed beats, and then his heart skipped a beat, seeing Minari's eyes. Emmange Kyo? 
The situation had gotten much messier in his mind. The beasts, the Achiha, mysterious shuriken whom he couldn't detect, and also this teleporting humanoid demon. Ah, uh, more and more pests keep on arriving. It's the same story in every world I go to. Feudal, everything is feudal. Minashiki raged madly. He hated being interrupted. Minari's attack had already subsidized. She couldn't do it the whole time after all. Minashiki put his hand on the wood that had entrapped him. Whoosh. It caught fire and then got blasted by a sudden attraction and repulsion force. Worlds? Where are you from? Hashirama confusedly asked. Space. His species travel worlds and take away their life energy, destroying all life in return. Shuriken gave a short answer. Hashirama's face twitched as soon as he heard that. If that was the case, this man was much more dangerous than any ninja war. But he still didn't grasp the danger this being possessed. He's right. But I am not interested in your world. All I want is this boy, and then I will leave. But if you try to come in between us, I will kill you right now. Minashiki threatened. Hashirama turned to look at the beasts. I only came here to capture them. Then do it and leave, Minashiki said, as this was advantageous to him. The less annoying beings around, the more he could focus on Shuriken and see the secrets of his body. But it enraged Shuriken. Hashirama, don't you dare. If you even lay a finger on my family, I will make sure your bloodline ceases to exist. Family? Them? They are mindless beasts. Hashirama argued. Yuki spoke in a sad voice. That's what you think about us? Even after so many centuries? Really, you humans are the worst of those living on this planet. We are beings with free will, and nobody has the right to catch or enslave us. BM Minashiki moved. He punched Hashirama and flew to Shuriken. The punch was destructive as he was thrown away like a ragdoll, getting heavily injured. But Hashirama had a very quick regeneration ability. He slowly got up and looked at Minashiki angrily. He activated his sage mode as well, because of which black markings appeared on his face. Forgive me, but to protect my village and ensure peace, I must catch them. He resolutely muttered. It was clear now that if he survives to see tomorrow, he will catch the tailed beasts no matter what. Hashirama had changed now, as said by Madara Achiha in his last words. The current him lacked the warmth of a human and had a firm will to protect his village, no matter what. Even if he had to kill his own friend, sibling, or even his own child, he would do it. Catching the beasts was a small price to pay according to him. He prepared himself to fight a three-way war now with Minashiki and Shuriken. However, as he was now in sage mode, he finally noticed something about Shuriken. God, he's entirely made of natural energy. His body has more concentration than the entire Shikatsa forest. He observed, realizing how big of a threat Shuriken was, so he acted. Clenching his teeth, he made hand seals, wood release. Wood dragon technique, Ruhr. Ten giant wooden dragons appeared. Each of them headed to a different target. One each for each tailed beast. One for Minari, one each for Shuriken and Minashiki. Boom. Boom. Each of them collided with their targets and exploded. Clouds of dust rose there. But the sound of clashing fists was still heard. Whoosh. All of a sudden, two figures appeared out of smoke. Both of them were in the air. Bam. You want to enslave my family? I will never let you. Shuriken punched Hashirama, one after another, damaging his face as eyes shined in demonic red color like never before. Boom! But Minashiki teleported above them and kicked both of them towards the ground. While falling, Shuriken sent a small Bijadama and... Hashirama sent exploding wooden balls, which would leave a sleeping gas. Thud, the two fell to the ground. They were all looking at each other. The fight was very messy. Hashirama looked behind. The tailed beasts were perfectly fine. Even the girl was, but he now noticed another headache. Around the girl was now a giant ashen-colored armor. 
He exclaimed, Susan knew, seeing no quick way to end this fight. He brought his scroll in front of him and opened it. Biting his thumb, he pressed on the paper. Sage art, wood release, true several thousand hands, whoosh. Countless trees grew on the ground, and it was now shaking and roaring as the ground would explode. Shuriken felt a great amount of natural energy there, so he jumped a few steps back, then right in front of his eyes. All those trees assimilated, creating a Buddha with countless hands, bigger than any mountain he had seen in his life. Forgive me, this is for my village, for peace, Hashirama emotionlessly said, receiving a glance from the angry red eyes of Shuriken. Boom, mountains flattened, trees became dirt, and small lakes ceased to exist. This was the effect of the giant Buddha statue Hashirama had made. It eclipsed all the tailed beasts and even the Susanoo. But on the other hand, Minashiki was looking at everything with excited eyes. Everything he had seen today had inspired him and excited him. He had learned things about the chakra he didn't know initially. To him, this was the charm of researching effects of chakra on various civilizations, because each develops differently, in the end making the Atsutsuki more powerful. Minashiki was a member of the exploration and experimenting group of the Atsutsuki clan. They were given the most respect, because they found ways to get stronger for the clan, and hence were also the first to get their hands on any new power. Amazing. Marvelous. The things you have achieved with your gifts. This world is truly worth studying. He madly spoke, but his laughter was no fun for the others. Shuriken now knew how Hashirama was going to catch all the tailed beasts. This was it. Nothing could get away from this monstrous jutsu. I need to stop this first of all. Shuriken jumped towards all the bijou so he could plan an attack with them. But there was also Minashiki who was sitting there like a headache. That whole statue is made of wood. As long as I can put my hand on it, I can take away its natural energy and it will dry up. Shuriken planned. Yes, and also it's too big, so there is no way he can take care of his backside. Even more so when we will be attacking from the front, Matatabi said. Then let's do this. Minari, you try to attack that Atsutsuki from a distance, since your attacks seem to be working on him. I just need a small window of opportunity, he suggested to her. All of them firmly agreed. They were all in this together. You go, Shiro. We will handle the front. Shuriken jumped from there and ran into the forest to hide his presence. Then, all the bijou started to throw bijoudamas on the giant Buddha statue one after another. But they had no idea that the giant statue's hands were also able to produce hand seals and send attacks. This meant that Hashirama could create 500 attacks jutsu at the same time. Boom! Boom! They dodged, they got hit, they stumbled, but they never gave up. It was a fight for their freedom, for the sake of their family. Shuriken was constantly hearing the explosion sounds. His heart raced very fast. That was if he had any, but he did have feelings. He glanced at the sky. Minashiki was still looking at the Buddha statue with glowing eyes. I hope he stays there. He circled behind the statue of Buddha. There were no hands behind it, and this was probably the most vulnerable side. He dashed at full speed and arrived. Clinging on the wood, he started taking away all its natural energy. It probably had thousands of trees combined into it to make itself. Whoosh. Minari was now focused on keeping Minashiki busy away from the ongoing fight. She once again used the Light of Doom, the energy beam. Now in her Susanoo form, it was greatly intensified. Bang! With a boom, it traveled in the air and hit Minashiki, who was distracted by the giant Buddha. It blew him away and also hurt him. He angrily turned to look at Minari. I will take your eyes first. They are fascinating, Minashiki claimed and flew directly towards her. She was ready. Her Susanoo had claws sharper than anything currently existing in material form. As Minashiki came close to her, she started slashing at him. 
the enhanced speed, strength, and maneuverability made her slightly more dangerous even for him. She moved like a panther, fast and agile. Slash, she made a cut on his body. Good, you are not weak. I presume your eyes made you this strong. Then don't mind me, Minashiki emotionlessly said. The Atsutsuki clan had the cheat of regenerative capabilities and a humongous chakra reserve. For a mortal like Minari, just using Susanoo was exhausting. On top of that, she was using her eye power. What was more troubling to her was that she was using Susanoo for the first time. Every minute she stayed in this form depleted her chakra by a huge amount. I will die if I stop. I can't. She told herself. B.E.M. Minashiki threw a punch at her. She fell back, but he didn't give her a chance to stand up. He flew to the giant Susanoo's head and started punching. Boom, boom, a a a I will not die today. Minari screamed in pain and tried to get up. No, you won't. I will first experiment with your eyes, then you will die. Minashiki talked back and kept punching. The Susanoo started to slowly diminish. All the tailed beasts noticed this and tried to run to her to help. Thud! But they were being dragged and locked by the hundreds of arms of the statue. Roar, they shouted, sending Bijidamas. Minari was in mortal danger now. Minashiki had gone crazy, trying to rip off the Susanoo armor with his bare hands. Hashirama was focused on catching the tailed beasts. As long as he sealed them, he could focus on the flying man, A.H. But all of a sudden, he felt his Buddha statue getting weaker and weaker. He tried to channel more sage chakra into it, but all of it would get turned into normal chakra. He tried to find a reason, and that was when he noticed that Shuriken was missing. What was in front of him was just a clone, but because it was also made of natural energy, he had no way of finding out without focusing. Sensing that his sage chakra was being vanquished from behind the statue, he left the front and jumped to the back while focusing to keep the statue moving. He extended a hundred arms and sent them to attack Shuriken. Poof, the one he attacked vanished in smoke. Another clone? Hashirama muttered, trying to find the real Shuriken. He himself started to look for him around the whole statue. After a few seconds, he would see Shuriken, but every time it would turn out to be a clone. Shiro, save Minari! Chomei suddenly shouted. He had been able to free himself from the statue and now flew higher in the air. Shuriken was currently moving around on the statue, making Hashirama foolishly chase after him while he took away the natural energy. As he heard Chome, he looked for Minari. He saw the big white armor slowly losing its color. His heart skipped a beat, seeing her inches away from death. He aborted everything and dashed towards her. After all, if something happened to the Bijou, they can return to life. If something happened to him, as long as there is even a tiny piece of him left, he can also return. But if Minari died, that was the end. Leave her. He landed from the sky directly over Minashiki. He finally had his sword out. Shuriken's whole body was at the moment covered in a white hue. It was the energy of his body that had materialized enough for the normal eye to see. Hashirama saw it all happening and felt a shiver run down his spine. Shuriken's strength was unknown right now. Shuriken moved so fast that only his red eyes made an after image, while his whole body was just invisible. Clank Shuriken's sword struck Minashiki's head, but the Atsutsuki stopped the sword strike with his horns. He stopped punching Minari and looked at Shuriken. Ho ho, that was a dangerous strike. Minari now, Shuriken shouted. Minari in an instant stopped using Susanoo and moved away from them. She stumbled a few steps back, panting and bleeding. Clash, Shuriken and Minashiki started sword fighting with each other. Shuriken's body was brimming with energy right now, and he finally found himself able to slightly handle the physical strikes. You will not return home today, Shuriken declared. He had a plan to deal with Minashiki once and for all. With a smirk, Minashiki lifted 
his one arm and aimed. Wishful thinking. Heavenly pull. Shuriken found his body being pulled towards Minashiki. He tried to stop himself by plunging the sword on the ground, but then the ground started to get lifted off. Nervously, a distance away, Minari was looking at this in fear. She felt useless, helpless. All her practice, all her powers were useless. She may be near the apex power in terms of the world, but to an Atsutsuki, she was weak. Don't die, Shiro, she shouted. I need to do something, she muttered to herself and ran towards Minashiki with her own normal sword. Look, she screamed near Minashiki to get his attention. Ha ha, then you die first. And after taking away yours and that man's body, I will destroy this world. Minashiki moved his other hand with the horn slash sword and aimed it at Minari. Hashirama's heart fell when he heard this. He looked at the fight going on with a hint of confusion in his mind, thinking if what he was doing was even right. Minari was just a few inches away from the sword's tip. At that moment, she looked Minashiki in the eyes and he did the same. For the first time, Minari's left eye started bleeding. Whoosh. Ha. Minari stopped in her tracks, shocked at what was happening. Minashiki's body had slowed down. It was as if he was moving slower than a turtle. His eyes too now looked hazy, as if there was no life in them. It seemed like he was stuck in some kind of a strong genjutsu. Did my other eye do something? She wondered. Ha ya. Slash shuriken had not stopped. Instead, because of the pull, he had increased his speed, and with one great thrust, he plunged his sword into Minashiki's chest. However, that was not all. He inserted his whole right hand in his chest and grabbed Minashiki's heart in his fist. This is over, he declared. Minashiki's body twitched, but he couldn't come out of whatever Minari did. All he was seeing right now was a white light with no sense of space, sound, time, vision, or touch. S-H-H-H-H-H, but all of a sudden, smoke started to come out of Minashiki's body, covering the area, turning everything colder than the northern winter. It was as if some kind of a safety mechanism had activated, as his whole body started to get covered in some kind of a crystal. Starting from his feet, Shuriken grimaced, his eyes turning a deeper red, realizing what was to come now. But if he truly wanted to kill Minashiki, he couldn't afford to move right now, not when he had the heart in his palm. Shiro, let him go, Minari pleaded. She was on the ground, utterly tired and unable to move. No, I can't, not before I take away his whole life force. As long as he lives, he will be a danger to everyone. You, the Bijou, Jean, the village. All will be in danger. He replied sternly. As just slowly, the crystal covered Minashiki's form entirely, and now it started to extend to Shuriken's arm, which had grabbed his heart. But what will happen to you? What if that crystal kills you? She cried in anxiety. I cannot. I have his energy to survive. Remember, Minari, I am the lord of Dama Village, and it is my duty to protect you all. He replied with a hint of sadness. He had already started to drain Minashiki's energy, and he was shocked by how much it was. This was what thousands of years of training gave him. But Shuriken did not know if his body could even handle all this. Sigh, this will take me years to absorb, he realized. Shuriken looked back at all the tailed beasts. His eyes were sad and on the edge of tearing up. Chomei, Gyuki, Sun, Goku, Koko, Isabu, Matatabi, and Saiken. I will come for you, I promise. No matter what. So please be safe. No, Shiro, let him go. Saiken shouted while fighting the Buddha statue's many arms. All of them were throwing Bijadama one after another at it. However, it only destroyed a few arms. Hashirama had also used his enlightenment power to put two of them to sleep already. There is no other way. Nobody can beat him if I don't do it. He will destroy this planet if I let go today, and that will be the end of all of us. Shuriken replied. He heard stories from Kurama about the Atsutsuki clan, 
and he had a rough guess of the risk they posed. Shuriken turned to Hashirama. As the crystal nearly reached his head, he boomed. You betrayed humanity today? History may be kind to you, but I won't be. Hashirama's face fell. Those words hit him heavier than any blow till now. He didn't have the time to understand the motivations of Shuriken. All he saw was a strange inhuman being made of natural energy, which could even make him look weak. He remembered the only attack he received from that horn man, and it was just a simple punch, but he couldn't even take it and it destroyed half of his body. Only with quick regeneration was he able to continue. He felt he was not really a threat to either Minashiki or Shuriken. If he was fighting one-on-one -on -one with either of them, he may not have won. Stay safe. Until I'm back, my dear family, Shuriken spoke his last words as his eyes shined brighter than ever before and stayed open. No. Minari tried to crawl towards the crystal and dig it, but her sword broke down in an instant. Hashirama tried to come and see it too, thinking maybe he would be able to help somehow, while feeling slightly crestfallen. Seeing this, all the tailed beasts panicked. Protect Shiro! All the tailed beasts raged, now truly looking like mindless beasts, madly trying to get away from the hold of the Buddha statue. They threw Bijudama one after another on all sides. Hashirama stopped on his way and went back to trying to hold them still and bring them under full control with his wood release. Boom! Gyuki soon was able to reach his tentacles near the crystal. In one fell swoop, he smashed at it. It surely didn't break, but it was sent away flying into the sky so high that it went out of vision soon to land in some random place. If it didn't break with my blow, there aren't many who can break it then Gyuki sighed in relief and turned to Minari. Run. Run away. Shiro will be back soon. And until then, you must keep the village alive. Until we all return, you must keep the village safe. We will be together once again, he promised that. And we promise it too, Gyuki loudly said. Next, all the tailed beasts touched each other while Gyuki put one tentacle on Minari's head softly. They transferred some energy to her weakened body, so she could escape as fast as possible. Go away. Take care of my farm, Minari. I will make the best cake when Shiro is back. Saiken told her jokingly. She laughed and cried at the same time, looking all messy. But she accepted their command and ran away. Please be safe. Saint Beasts, she muttered and vanished into the jungle, tears constantly flowing from her eyes. Back at the battlefield, now only Hashirama and the seven-tailed beasts were left. He had already caught them, now all he needed to do was to temporarily seal them so he can transport them to the trading location. The beasts had calmed down, knowing that what was going to happen now can't be avoided, and most of them were the calm ones except Sun Goku. Matatabi turned to Hashirama and spoke. You could have found hundreds of other ways to bring peace, but you chose the path of violence. Now don't mind us when we do the same and decide to destroy your villages when we are set free again. Sun Goku threatened. However, Hashirama seemed too confident in his abilities. I will stop you again then. Gyuki scoffed. Haha. <laughs> Don't be so proud of yourself, human. You will eventually die, but we are immortal. And next time, there won't be an Atsutsuki to stop Shiro either. Just count your days to ruin now. Hashirama decided to ignore their threats and contain them. It was a jutsu, and only he and Madara were able to do it till now. Through this, they could put the tailed beasts into sleep or fully control them. After that, all he had to do was use his wood release to transport them. But before leaving, he looked in the direction Minari had left. She had the Mangekyo. I hope she never comes to the Land of Fire again, or I will have to act. Next, he looked at the direction Shuriken was thrown at. I must send men to look for that boy. It took Hashirama a few days to transport all the tailed beasts to the location where the Five Kage Summit was held. All the other Kages were present, along with the first Jinchuriki. 
The leader of the Uzumaki village was also there, to personally aid the sealing and hand over the key to the village kage. Senegekir's Kazakage had come without a Jinchuriki as their village already had the beast. Kimogekir's rakage had brought a young two-year-old girl named Yujini and a toddler boy named Blue A. All the other villages had also brought either young children or early teenagers. Hashirama didn't like this, as it was akin to torturing a child, but he couldn't say anything about this. He oversaw the whole ceiling, and in the end, all five villages signed a peace treaty. Hashirama, happy and satisfied, returned to the village, but he hid all that happened while catching the beasts. He feared that these villages would get paranoid and think the fire country had such powerhouses. He also didn't want Shuriken to fall in someone else's hand, as a body made of natural energy was very valuable for research. He soon arrived back in his village. Tobarama, did a boy named Shuriken arrive here? Tobarama nodded, yes, and I told him about Suna's beast and sent him to you. Hashirama sighed, you did well, but we have more important work to do. That boy was very strong, strong enough to probably kill me. And we have a bigger problem, the Atsutsuki clan, possible beings from space, who eat energies of whole worlds to get stronger. Hashirama told everything to his younger brother. In the end, they sent many teams of ninjas to look for the Crystal Minashiki and Shuriken were trapped in. While Hashirama planned to make his village stronger, he didn't know how, but he had to. Though a surprise was waiting for him, a gift from a certain black blob. Whoosh. Minari reached the fleeing villagers. Jean was leading them to the south of the fire country, in hope of finding a good land to settle. Her hair, her face, all looked smudged. Her eyes were red with tears, and her mangekyo was still active. She had run for a whole day to reach them. Minari! Jean immediately hugged her and brought her to a temporary tent, Fumiko and the village leader also gathered there. From the looks of her, it was probably not good news. She was given some water and then asked what happened. Sniff, but she teared up. Jean helped her calm down for a few minutes before she could start. I, Shiro is gone, and so are the saint beasts. She told them everything from start to finish. They already knew about the attack of the Atsutsuki, as she had informed them before the evacuation. But how the fight ended shocked them. Gyuki said that Shiro will surely return, but when, that's not clear. The Saint Beasts asked me to make sure our village stays strong and growing, so we can all be together again someday. Everyone, from young to old, cried at the tragedy. Their beloved lord was gone. They felt powerless and helpless. Even after being inhumanly strong, they felt they were too weak in comparison to Shinobi. They cursed the gods, or whoever made them. Why they didn't make all humans the same. Why make a few strong and the rest weak. Jean clenched his fist, feeling the same, but he couldn't show his sorrow in public. Where should we go now? Dama Village will most likely be searched for by them. Minari wiped clean her eyes. I can't be weak. I must lead them. I must not cry. Not until Shiro is back. We will go to the tea country. There are no shinobi villages. We will slowly take over the daimyo's position and rule the country. We will surprise Shiro with the first Dama country. A country where the saint beasts are loved and cherished. She firmly decided. Everyone's hearts felt warm. This was a good dream and an achievable one for them. They all left the tent for her to rest. Jean stayed by her side. He hugged her and also shed a few tears. Jean was the first human friend of Shuriken. Since he was five, he had seen Shuriken grow up and had played with him all his life. To him, Shuriken was as close to his heart as his mother or Minari. We are with you, Minari. If these countries can't accept us, then let's make a country of our own. Minari silently hugged him tight and nodded repeatedly. And so, they crossed over from Fire Country into the Tea Country. There, they first set up a temporary camp in the jungle. 
unknown location, Shuriken was still conscious. Although he was trapped in the strange crystal, he was not strong enough to break it. And the only one strong enough was under some genjutsu. He looked around through his open eyes at the location. It seems I am in some kind of a cavern. But which country it is, I don't know. I will be back, everyone. Please don't give up. This was going to be his home for the foreseeable future until he can get out of this crystal. Shuriken was honestly bored. He was just stuck here, slowly ending Minashiki's life. It was taking too much time. He couldn't even close his eyes as he was frozen. But after spending a long time, he just fell unconscious. But then his unconscious mind was at work. As he was made of natural energy, he tried to feel everything around him. It should be possible since everything had natural energy. In the beginning, he couldn't, but slowly, as if his inner eyes were opening, he started to see things. It was all black, and white as if it was some kind of a see-through vision, but he could hear sounds faintly. At first, he saw the surroundings of the cavern he was in. It wasn't too big and seemed to be underground, instead of being some cave in a mountain. Can't I look outside? Shuriken's mind wondered. There were some roots of trees, so he tried to feel the natural energy in them. It took him an unknown amount of time, but eventually he was able to sense it. He looked outside. It was a jungle. The first thing his mind wanted was to look for the villagers, but there were limitations. He couldn't see further than a few trees. This meant he wasn't strong enough. When Shuriken was busy trying to increase his sensory range, a certain black blob tried to break into the crystal. Must kill him. If he can defeat such a strong Atsutsuki, what will happen to Mother? Clank, he tried to dig through the crystal for days, but nothing worked. Damn you, what is this made of? Eventually, he decided to leave a white humanoid thing inside the ground to keep an eye on it. So that when the crystal breaks or something happens, the black blob can return. Kanahagakor! Cough. Grandpa, what happened to you? A blonde little girl worriedly ran to Hashirama. Nothing. My little Tsunade. I'm just old now. Cough. I need to talk to Mito. Will you go out? He sent her away. Once he was alone with his wife, he handed her a small scroll. I believe something has happened to me. I do not know when my end might arrive. This scroll has some things that have happened in my life. These must be kept a secret forever, and only the Hokage and the elders are to know about this. Mito worriedly held Hashirama's arm, but you told me so many times that your body can heal forever. I don't know, Mito. Maybe it's the result of all the bad deeds I have done. One of the biggest ones being too recent. I worry for the village now, Mito. There are powers out there that can stomp on us like insects and I gravely offended one of them. I just hope the peace I tried to bring lasts long enough for this cycle of hatred to wash away, Hashirama said with a saddened face and a weakened voice. Mito also felt that Hashirama seemed too weak now. She took his warnings seriously. Have you told Tobarama? She asked. Not yet. He's too paranoid. I'm afraid if he knows I suddenly fell sick, he will start suspecting people, mainly the Uchiha. Hashirama concluded. They continued talking, unknown that just under the ground they sat. Someone stayed still, listening to everything. It was yet another white humanoid thing, who was also responsible for what had happened to Hashirama. The reason was simple. A being so powerful, like Hashirama, had no need to be alive anymore. Not after he had played his part in the grand scheme of things. Author's note, there is no canon information on how Hashirama died. It's dumb to assume he died in a fight, not after how he caught the beasts. The only thing left is some kind of disease. The peace pact Hashirama had signed was for the five villages and nations, but peace was nothing but a farce. Now the five countries went from fighting each other to instigating a fight in small nations, between clans and villages. What was there to gain? Money. 
When small nations went to war, their industries get destroyed, their agriculture cycles get disrupted, then they have no choice but to buy all things from others. This way, the five great Shinobi countries made money. However, contrary to normal beliefs, these actions were not taken just by the five Shinobi villages. Instead, this was done by the five daimyo, the feudal lords. To keep the treasury full and their countries from starving, they promoted the war in smaller nations. The shinobi villages, meanwhile, made money by getting themselves hired by these war-torn regions for various missions. So, the dream of Hashirama was never a reality. His idea of peace was myopic and delusional. In just one year, Hashirama's peace treaty started to crumble. Sunagakir started to show signs of hostility, and the land that was leased to it was now full of Sunagakir shinobi. They refused to acknowledge that the land belonged to the fire country. Sensing an inevitable conflict, Hashirama, who now looked as if he had aged a hundred years in just one year, made Tobarama the Hokage. In another year, Hashirama passed away silently in his sleep. There was no one who could have defeated him, but he died from what everybody believed to be an unknown disease caused by his overuse of regenerative ability. Tobarama tried to keep his village as strong as possible. Wanting to prepare it for what was to come, he brought many changes. He had already started the Ninja Academy and the Chunin exams. Next, he created the Kanoa police, and the role was given to the Uchiha clan. He also developed many great jutsu that would help the village for generations. Slowly, the conflicts that the five countries had started in small countries began to spread into their boundaries, like cancer spreading from one part to another. Tobarama, wanting to prepare for any big confrontation, headed to Kumobikure with his escort unit. He wanted to sign a peace deal with them, and from the initial talks, Kumo was interested too. However, when the peace treaty ceremony was taking place, the Gold and Silver Brothers, Gingaku and Kingaku, staged a coup d'etat that left the second rakage, A, on the brink of death. Tobarama was able to escape from there with his team intact, but they were hounded by Kingaku force a special team of at least 20 highly skilled shinobi from Kumobikure. They tried to race to Kanahagakure, but it was too far away. Nobody had guessed a coup would happen so suddenly. The Kingaku force was also elite. They were about to catch Tobarama and his subordinates. Hiruzen Saratobi, Koharu Yudetain, Hamura Midokado, Danzo Shimura, Kagami Achiha, and Torfu Ikimichi. Tobarama knew that someone would have to stay to stop them. So after a small one-sided discussion, he decided to act as a decoy so that his subordinates could escape. But before he died, Tobarama appointed one of his students, Hiruzen Saratobi, just 22 years old, to be the next Hokage. But this was just the start of the war. Hiruzen, with the elder advisors of the previous Hokages, tried to keep their village alive. The war was bloody, Sunagakure and Iwagakure had come to knock on their door. Kirigakure did not fight Kanahagakure at that time. They targeted Kumogakure. Kumo also had to quickly elect a new rakage, as the previous one was heavily injured in the coup. Handling Sunagakure was not very hard for Kanoha. All they needed was to make sure their food supplies were destroyed. Next was Iwagakure which was the trickiest. In the end, all nations had suffered so much that they came to sign a mutual armistice treaty. The era of Hashirama ended with the beginning of a new shinobi world, filled with war, suffering, and malice. Peace was nowhere to be found. Shuriken was still inside the crystal. He had no sense of time, so all he could do was try to look outside with his newfound nature sense. Every day, he would see an inch further. This meant he was getting stronger. To him, Minashiki was like a battery. He occasionally saw a few people outside, mostly shinobi, running from one tree to another. But he had no idea what was exactly going on outside. 
He often missed his family, being carefree with them and playing. He missed Sykin's constant nagging to drink more milk to stay healthy, and also eat the cake because he liked making them. He missed stories from Kurama and Yuki. He missed playing around with son Goku. Most of all, he missed his home. I wonder how are they doing now, tea country, it was a beautiful green country with a lot of pastures. A reason for being named the land of tea was for its tea houses, which were just too many. Even on a desolate road, you would find a tea stall. Jean and Minari had set up the camp in the jungle, and they headed out to see what this place was all about. Being a small country, learning everything was not too much of a problem, and since there existed few to no shinobi, it was an ideal place for their village. They came to find out about generations of rivalry between the Wasabi family and the Wagarashi family, two powerful clans in the country with much monopoly on the only biggest port in the country. Are you thinking what I am thinking? Jean asked his wife with a smile. Minari nodded. She had become much better now, although she would never forget the day Shiro and the beasts were taken away. She came to accept the reality. Of course, my husband. Let's use their rivalry against them and reap the harvest ourselves, she planned. Then you go to one family, I will go to another. Good luck. Jean and Minari walked in different directions. The times after the war were of peace. Well, at the very least, it looked like peace. The big five nations went back to healing themselves after the war. Their scars were too deep this time. Sunagakir, which had gotten a special agreement for the discounted grains from Fire Country, lost the agreement. The land that was leased to them was also taken back. Now Sunagakir was back to square one, once again weak, poor and hungry. Iwagakir was the same, although they didn't face too much damage, they were poor to begin with. Kimogakir had to appoint a new rakage as the old one died. Kinkaku and Ginkaku were announced as criminals and the shame of Kimogakure. Kirigakure was also reeling from their own problems. Compared with all these, Kanoha was in a much better situation. But the same could not be said about the small nations that fell between the big ones. They were hopeless, as they were now left in ruins. A great many villages were destroyed, lives lost and children were orphaned. It had been ten years since the war, and nothing much had changed. Instead, the peace now seemed like the silence before the storm. Um, uh, Omom! Shuriken was looking around through his nature vision. In the past ten years, he had gained the ability to see around himself in a 100 kilometer radius through the help of nature. Whether it be trees, sand, rocks, or even water, he could see through them, but it was all in a black and white x-ray vision. Finally, after ten years, he had seen the condition of what used to be his happy home, Village Dama. It saddened him to no limits. Now overgrown with vegetation, it can't even be recognized. It seemed so lifeless, even with all the trees around. He was yet to find any clues about his family. He just hoped he'd be able to see further soon. As his range increased, he started to find that newer roads were made for people. There were 180 kilometers away from where he was. What are they doing? He wondered when he saw two shinobi behind a large tree, sidestep from the road. Ah ah ah. Faster. Give me your seeds. Sh don't shout. Shuriken immediately looked away understanding what kind of unholy activity was going on there. He looked in other locations. At least, by doing this, he was not getting bored anymore. It was like another exercise for him. At that moment, Minashiki's body looked paler than before, as if someone had squeezed matter from his body. Though Shuriken was doing exactly that, but with energy, he could feel his body getting immensely stronger. He was also still growing bigger, and more muscular. Thankfully, with the decrease in Minashiki's size, more space was becoming available for him. Boom! When Shuriken was looking at the distance, he felt the ground shake inside the cavern. He quickly retracted his vision and looked above the cavern, which was now fully covered 
and had grass over its ground. Over there, he saw a little boy crying in pain, lying on the ground. His body was riddled with wounds, too many to count. Blood was oozing from his disfigured face. His right arm and leg were missing. He had short hair. That's all Shiro could see. He was maybe 12 years old, but Shuriken didn't have much experience in guessing ages, as people in Dama Village were weird. Many were more than a hundred, and yet stayed so fit. Oh no, the poor boy will die, Shuriken thought. Whoosh. Then Shuriken saw an older boy arrive. He was in ninja clothing, had a slim build with very long black hair and a long face. He looked at the dying body of the boy. We are still being attacked. I cannot take you back right now. Don't worry, I will come back. The older boy said, and then took something from the dying boy's body. After that, the older boy just left, maybe to fight whoever was chasing them. The poor little boy just laid there, not even having the strength to cry in pain. His eyes were slowly losing their light. Death was imminent, and no medical ninja could heal him now. He had lost too much blood. Shuriken waited to see if the old shinobi would come back, but even after five minutes, he did not. And the little boy didn't have much time left. Can I help him? Shuriken wondered. He focused all his energy on a single tree that was the closest to the boy. Then, as he willed it, the tree's trunk opened and small roots came out of the ground. The boy was then dragged into the tree's trunk, where some roots pierced into his body, one specifically into his heart. Then the tree trunk closed. Shuriken sent his young energy combined with natural energy into the body. He did this to heal most people anyway after all. Just now he was doing it remotely. Author's note. You can use your imagination to understand it. In is to bring a certain form into existence, then giving it life, yang, so that it can function on its own. Proper mastery of yin yang techniques is typically limited to the Rinnegan users of the series, like the Sage of Six Paths and Pain. Shiro does not have mastery over it, but knows enough to use it on a small scale. He currently has bigger mastery on Yang release, which lets him heal people. It took Shuriken an hour before the boy's condition stabilized. He just let him stay in the tree trunk, and though his body won't grow, he will at least live. Shuriken then started looking around once again. After a while, he saw the older slim boy come back to that location. But he couldn't find the body anywhere. He didn't even try to look and simply left, never to come back again. It had been ten years for Dama village dwellers. Minari and Jean were the de facto leaders of the village, as the old man Rakamatsu stepped down since he was now more into bodybuilding. Minari and Jean did a simple thing to take over the country. They needed to control their trade. What better way than to take over the Degarashi port town? For this, they needed to be accepted by the people of the town. They devised a plot. Dama Village never really lacked money. They set up a few tea processing factories in the town, providing lots of jobs to the people. They became widely known as Nidama family. The Wasabi family and the Wagarashi family tried to deal with them on different occasions, but all attempts were thwarted. In just one year, they proclaimed themselves the strongest family in Degarashi port. Previously, the way to decide who gets to run the town was a competition between the two families. Todoroki Great Shrine Race, a festival held every four years originally established to dedicate Ryoka's jewels. However, over the years, the purpose of the race was shifted to determine who holds power in Degarashi port. This time, the Nidama family was also there to compete, and Jean being superhuman and Minari, a superhuman peak Achiha woman, they squashed their competitors, finishing the race in record time. This is where the Daimyo's role came in. Daimyo of Tea Country was a foolish old fat man who probably saw nothing in his life other than food. He even refused to marry, as that would mean sharing food. Jean fed him money to come and see the race, 
and officiate the ruler of the port town for the next four years. This way, the Nidima family fully seated themselves in the country. All this happened in just the first two years of their arrival. After this, they went on a business deal spree. They took away all the business of the Wasabi family and the Wagarashi family by undercutting them. Nidima family could afford this, but they could not. Meanwhile, Jean became good friends with the daimyo, as he had a lot of money, which meant better food to the daimyo. They then played a game. They brought a single old woman from Dama village. She happily volunteered, as she was very bored. She was none other than the strong-minded Fumiko, Jin's mother. Her job was simple, to seduce the daimyo and make him marry her, all the while feeding him tasty food. In just one year, daimyo was head over heels for her, as she didn't take his food and instead gave him more and tastier stuff. It was a costly matter, but worth the work. In no time, he called for an official marriage. It was done quickly, and with that, Fumiko became the wife of Daimyo. Now, for a common man who never exercised or liked moving, who was fat beyond belief, it was normal to have lots of medical conditions. One year after marriage, his heart gave up. With his death, Fumiko's son, Jean became the new Daimyo of Tea Country. Along with the whole Dama village's strength, nobody had the guts to protest their rule. In fact, they made the country richer by establishing good ties with the land of noodles. This way, they created this relationship where one bought lots of tea and the other bought lots of noodles. In 10 years, they completed their first goal. Now, they would only rename the country after Shiro returns, but Minari wanted to go and look for Shuriken now. She knew he was stuck in a crystal, and she wanted to find it and bring it to their new daimyo palace, which was bigger than the whole previous Dama village. Here, the Nidma clan lived. I assure you, I am not going there to fight. I just want to bring back Shiro, so the first thing he sees after waking up will be us. Please don't try to stop me. She told Jean. Jean had gotten stronger in the meantime. All the people of Dama Village couldn't be considered normal humans anymore, as their strength spoke otherwise. But they were not shinobi either. They were something entirely different. I support your decision. If anybody, it's you who can go out and stay safe. But keep on sending updates. I'd hate it if you also went missing, Jean said, hugging her. Minari reciprocated and then smiled while blushing. Maybe when I return, we can have a baby. Jean was overjoyed. Of course. Let's have a lot of babies. It's time we give Shiro some nieces and nephews. He, I can already see him doting on them, spoiling them. Okay, I will take my leave now. Stay safe, and if any danger comes to the country, contact me immediately. Yes, yes. I've been a daimyo for years now, Minari. Jean grunted displeasingly. She for the one last time kissed him and went away. Both of them were old couples now, much more mature than before. They were officially in their 50s, but they looked like they were still in their late 20s. Pathetic. Utterly disappointing. For most of his life, Shuriken was shielded from the worst of mankind, from outer society. He only saw the people living in his village. All of them were kind people and never committed any crimes. To him, they were humans. But now, he found out that he was wrong. Those people were not humans, but saints. The real humans were outside. Humans who only cared about money, war, hate, revenge, and short-sighted gains. In the coming eight years, Shuriken saw so much death, pain, and suffering that he even felt like shutting his senses off. As his range of natural vision increased, he saw further and further. Some small human villages came into his sight. These villages were impoverished. The people were thin, on the verge of death. Then there was the occasional shinobi, be it someone from a village or rouges. None treated these people right. They all tried to exploit the people because they held power over their lives. One small kanaita and the mall. These ninjas sometimes would ask for money, or sometimes fancy a girl from the village, to become their plaything for a while. 
They were monsters in human skin. He felt shattered. He wondered if the Dama villagers also faced all this before he met them. He now got angrier at Hashirama. If he had helped him in dealing with Minashiki, then maybe he would have been out with his family. Ha. Huh. So he was only looking for peace in his own village. The world can go to hell for all he cared. I hope he's watching all this hell break loose. Shuriken tried to focus more on his power then. From saving that boy earlier, he knew he could control nature. But to what extent, that was yet to be known. By the way, the boy he had saved was still inside the tree. Although eight years had gone by, his body was still as small as before. He was still alive, just without an arm or leg. His face had also healed but was still disfigured. He remained unconscious as Shuriken supplied him with the energy to remain alive. Anyway, he started to experiment with his powers and soon realized he could use nature as his tool. He could move the tree to grab someone or even stab someone with a good branch. He could make the sand become quicksand and swallow people. He could use the river water to suddenly increase its flow for a short time. He also started seeing a tint of color now. But all these activities required immense concentration. Oh, who are these people? Shuriken saw a small group of people traveling on the road nearby. He knew that he was not too far away from where he had fought Minashiki. Yuki had probably made it an illusion that he threw him too far away. This way, nobody will try to look for him anywhere close to the fighting site. There was a cute young girl in the group. She had red hair and a little nervous face. Are you sure they won't make fun of me? The girl asked. Lady Kushina, don't worry. I'm sure they will care for you there. The women walking along said, but my red hair will stick out too much. They're going to call me a tomato, I know it, but I will beat them to a pulp if they do. She raged and her hair stood up. Shuriken was seeing such funny interactions after a long time now. It warmed his heart to see that normal people also lived in the world. People whose problems started with and ended with whether they can make friends and have fun or not. He too is like this after all. But then he saw reality, became less ignorant, and his bubble burst. I wonder where she is going. Shuriken thought and kept looking around. Then he noticed something after two years. The activities increased around the whole periphery. He could see as far as 200 kilometers, and there were too many ninjas going around, armed to the teeth. Then a few days later, fights erupted. Once again, everywhere Shuriken looked, it was death. Just like in the war before. But he knew nothing about war. He knew nothing about the world as his eyes didn't allow him to see that far. This conflicting period went on for a few years. Then it stopped for one year only to resume again. Shuriken was shocked. Seeing the value of life was so low here. All he saw were animals, ready to kill with no one to fear. He saw this go on for years. Minari didn't come to see the Dama village, even though she wanted to as it could be under the eye of some shinobi. She had looked around in distant areas from where Shiro was thrown away, but she could not find him. In the meantime, she had to return to tea country because the second shinobi war had started. She didn't want to find unnecessary trouble. After the war ended, she decided to look for Shiro again. But to her surprise, the war only stopped for a year to resume into what was being called the Third Shinobi War, and she saw this as the bloodiest conflict yet. The reason being, in the previous two wars, all the powerful and experienced Shinobi had already died. Now, the villages were lacking manpower, so they started using little kids who were fresh out of their academies and lacked any experience. She saw so many of such children die, and it pained her. She really desired that Shiro and the Saint Beasts come back and flatten the world into nothingness because there was nothing but misery here. The war had actually started for a very stupid reason. Iwagakure had invaded the Land of Rain on the falsified reason that insurgents from Amage Cure were terrorizing their lands 
and needed to be controlled to prevent future conflicts. Kanahagakur and its allies allowed this occupation to exist, but requested to send aid teams in order to assist the wounded. It was denied, and this made Kanoha doubt the intentions of IWA. So they sent an Anbu team which was caught and killed. Iwagakur then accused Kanoha and declared them as the enemy. On the other side, Sunagakur, the ally of Kanoha at that time, found its Kazakage missing. They suspected Iwagakur and declared war. Kanoha, being their ally, also declared war on Iwagakur. Besides this, Kanoha already had animosity with Kumobikur because they attempted to kidnap the Kanoha's Jinchuriki. With this, a true world war started, but she focused on her mission. In her mind, the doubt that someone might have already found Shiro also made rounds. So she decided to go to Kanoha and check if her doubts are real. She did not go through the gates and just jumped in. It was easy for someone like her, with 60 years of ninja experience and still being in prime physical condition. This place has not changed much. I guess this is what you get when wars are your pastime. She muttered and looked around. BM, when walking around, someone all of a sudden bumped into her. Looking behind, there was a boy maybe 8 years old. He had black eyes and short, spiky black hair. He wore a long-sleeved blue uniform and a blue jacket with an orange collar and trimmings. The standard Kanoha dark blue forehead protector and a pair of goggles with orange lenses connected to ear protectors. Then finally she noticed the Uchiha clan crest at the back. Ah, sorry, sorry, big S. The boy stopped in the middle. His face blushed, seeing Minari. Minari patted his head. It's okay. What's your name? He first blushed and then happily replied, I am Abito Uchiha, and I will one day become the Hokage. Ay, 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 ay. I'm getting late for my graduation. Minari chuckled and grabbed him by his collar. Then I will give you a lift. Ha. Wa. Before Abito could understand, he saw the world go blurry, and the next second, he appeared outside the ninja academy. Blink. Blink, he looked left and right in shock. T, that was so fast. So cool. Aren't you getting late? Minari reminded him. Abito turned sad. It's over already. I got too late helping that grandma. Yes, you have a strange knack for finding grandmas to help. A girl came out of the building with two blue stripes on her cheeks. Come with me, I have your certificate. Let's have your graduation ceremony now. She suggested. Rin, thank you so much. He felt like crying. Rin turned to Minari and asked, Will you be the witness to him graduating? Minari couldn't say no to these sweet children, so she agreed. Then, as a normal ceremony, Rin held the certificate and read it, while Abito stood in front of her. Through the rain and wind to reach this milestone. Here. Congratulations! She handed him the certificate with a big smile. Clap clap Minari remembered her life. Her childhood days with Shiro were so calm and sweet. Congratulations, hmm. You two deserve a reward for graduating then. Here, she jumped onto the stage and took out two silver shining kanai. A.H. How can I take this? It looks expensive. Abito stepped back. It's okay, we're all a family, right? Minari smilingly said, and activated her normal three Tomo Sharingan. Abito jumped in shock. You're from the clan? That's amazing, but I never saw you. See, we're a family. Here, take these. And promise me you will become a good shinobi, who helps the weak and raise their voice against injustice. Remember, sometimes using your own mind is more important than following orders. I wish you luck, bye-bye. She waved her hand and started leaving the school. Abito looked down at the kanai. It was very good looking, just like the one he wanted to win in that competition. The one that Kakashi won and took. Thank you. I will use this to protect people. Abito shouted. All people, not just the ones from your village. She just gave him a thumbs up and left the building. However, as soon as she arrived outside, 
An Anbu jumped in front of her. Lord Hokage wants to see you. He respectfully requests you to come. Really? If he's that respectful, then I have no reason to deny. But please move quickly, or I might arrive before you. She said and vanished from her place. The Anbu just stood there in shock for a second, only to run towards the Hokage office. Minari arrived directly in front of the building. Her face had a cold look, as this was the place where Toborama lied to her and Shiro. She was let inside immediately. Reaching the Hokage office, she didn't even look at their faces and went ahead to sit down on the sofa first. The atmosphere was cold and tense. Nobody made a sound as they felt nervous. In the room, there were two people present. Hiruzen Saratobi and Minato Namikaze. Hiruzen kept Minato so that he can immediately help him escape if anything happens. Why are you here? Hiruzen asked her. To collect some information, she replied coldly. How are you this young? It's as if you didn't age a single day since the last time. Hiruzen asked her. He had seen her when Shuriken and Minari had arrived to ask for the tailed beast's whereabouts. She scoffed. Is this why you asked me to meet you? Hiruzen took the cue and changed the topic. We have been searching for him too and haven't found him. We don't want any fight with you. You can stay in the village as long as you want, peacefully that is. Don't try to act friendly with me now. Your last two Hokage have sinned against my family and it will never be forgotten. I know St. Karama is here somewhere, trapped in somebody. But this is not the time to look for him. You can breathe. I will be leaving tomorrow. Take care, Hiruzen Sartobi. I'm sure Shiro would feel bad if he didn't find someone from the old generation to punish. She said and headed out. Sigh, both Hiruzen and Minato took long and easing breaths. Minato had his hand on Saratobi's shoulder the whole time, but he was confused. Who was she, Lord Hokage? Why did she act so prideful? And what's with her looking young? Who are these Kurama and Shiro? Hiruzen lit up his pipe and spoke. A mistake. Our mistake. I, I was naive to think they were gone. Lord Hashirama had written in a scroll that if his ways of peace fail and chaos erupt, Make sure you do everything in your power to befriend these people and the man named Shuriken. Otherwise, there will be nothing but doom for this village. Who are you talking about? Minato question, gods. Gods on earth, it's time you learn about what happened before Lord first caught and gave away the tailed beasts. But be warned, this is a secret of the highest level. If you tell anyone, I will have to kill you even if you are my protege. He started telling everything to his student, as he was cultivating him to become the Hokage. Minari just rented a small room to stay the night, and started compiling all the information she had gathered about all significant shinobi who lived or were still alive. She knew someone was trying to spy on her, and she knew it wasn't the Hokage. He wasn't dumb enough to be doing something like this. She wanted whoever this person was to make a move so she could interrogate him and get some information. But that person was proving to be a coward. Hmm, this shop wasn't here last time. I must test it so Shiro can later come to the best place to eat. She responsibly went to a ramen shop. It was not long since it was opened and a young man ran it. The shop was called Ichiraku Ramen. One bowl of your most famous ramen, please. She sat down. The owner of the shop, Tucci, first paused seeing her beauty, but quickly resumed his professional duty. One seaweed topping ramen coming right up. Boy, do you have dumplings too? She asked normally. Tucci's face contorted. Boy, I am 25 foot, but how can anybody know she was old enough to be a grandma by now? No, we don't serve dumplings at the moment, Tucci replied. Minari turned sad. Well... It's your loss. I recommend you start giving dumplings as a side dish too. I know someone who is very rich and loves dumplings. If you can make him happy, he will give you lots and lots of money. Tucci was young, 
So of course, money would entice him. Really? Who is he? Just a lord of a very rich village. He might come in a few years. You have enough time to develop a tasty dumpling recipe. She said and waited for the ramen. Tuchi, get me my usual... A boy ran in and took a seat. It was a Beto. He noticed Minari and cheerfully talked. A.H., it's you. Thank you for that, Kanai. But I don't even know your name. I am Minari Nidama. She replied. What? Aren't you an Achiha? She sighed. You don't become an Achiha by just having the word in the name. I have a long story. You tell me about yourself. Did you get assigned to a team? Abito widely smiled. I got in the same team as Rin he Ah, why don't you come with me? I'm sure Rin will love to see you again. Hmm. Who is your sensei? She asked. I don't know much about him. His name is Minato Namikes. He's Lord Third student I heard. His name is very famous. W-A-H. This is the best ramen ever. Abito told her everything while eating ramen. He ate his meal quickly and got up. Let's go, Lady Nidama. Abito held her hand and tried to pull her along. Thud. But she was far too strong for a kid to move. He fell comically with his legs forward and arm still holding Minari's hand. You are too weak, boy. You need to practice harder than anyone if you really want to become the Hokage. Let's go now, she said, and once again held him by his collar to pull him along like a lifeless ragdoll. Abito screamed in fright the whole way. You are late. Rin pouted when he arrived. Abito shyly rubbed his messy hair and apologized. Then he turned to his other friend slash opponent Kakashi to bicker. Ah, thank you for the gift, a miss. Rin quickly bowed and thanked her. Minari ruffled her hair. It's okay, just use it wisely. Call me Big Sister Minari if you want. She felt the ashen-haired boy looking at her. She went to him and patted his head too. Good child, your father was probably one of the only ninjas in the village who had the guts to use his brain and save his comrades instead of completing the mission. Human life is always more valuable than some mission. And those who can't even save their friends when given an opportunity don't deserve to be called a shinobi. I wish you luck that you will become a ninja who uses his brain, not just muscles. Minari then turned to look at where Minato was about to appear. Then, out of nowhere, he popped up. Hmm. Some kind of a teleportation jutsu. She deduced. Minato was surprised to see her here, but he felt better knowing he won't have to look for her anywhere now. Lady Nidama, good to see you here. You can watch us if you want. I will be taking their test. He addressed her respectfully. Without saying anything, she just went to the side, clapped her hands, and immediately the ground rose and formed a bench for her. Minato then proceeded to conduct the bell test. The test was for each student to take one of the two bells from their soon-to-be teacher within a set time limit in order to pass. Since there were three students, it would seem that one of them will be sent back to the academy no matter what. This, however, was a ruse to test out whether the three can work as a team. Abito, being ever excited, charged first and got beaten badly. Slowly, they started to team up and corner Minato, but all their efforts were in vain. Abito fell to the ground, tired and hungry. Ha, this is impossible. You are too fast, Sensei. Minato smilingly denied. No, you just need to work harder. We know you are called Yellow Flash of the Leaf. Nobody can be faster than you. I bet even Sister Nidama can't take those bells. Abito argued. Minato, seeing the perfect opportunity, turned to her. Do you want to try Lady Nidama? Whoosh. Even less than a tenth of a second. That's all it took. Minato didn't even see the blurry figure. Ting ting. Minari had the bells in her hand and played with them using her fingers. Minato seemed shocked. He didn't know how she moved so fast. The obvious conclusion he could think of was she also used a similar jutsu as he does. 
Do you also use a jutsu like mine? He asked her. She chuckled. Whoosh. In an instant, she appeared in front of him, standing just three feet away from him, handing him the bells. No, this is my pure physical speed. Shocked, right? Ha! Huh. This world is much more dangerous and mysterious than you can imagine, Minato Namikaze. He took the bells, but his mind was in a flurry. To achieve this much physical speed, one must have an inhuman body too. But Minari didn't have some crazy overgrowing muscles. This meant her body was inherently this strong, from the bones. Well, it's my time to leave. Goodbye, kids. Make sure you survive this war of big men, where you might have to fight soon. Be a shinobi who uses their head instead of blindly following orders. She waved at the three tired kids. Minato spoke up before she left. I'm sorry for what happened to your family and what the previous Hokage did. If I ever find him, I will tell you about it first. Minari paused and replied, Don't make empty promises, Kanoha Shinobi. We all know when the time will come, you will choose to lie and betray me in a second for this village of yours. Admit it. You shinobi don't see each other as fellow humans. Instead, you first notice the clan, the village, their strength. That has always been the case, and also the cause of conflict. She then vanished from her place. Minato was left standing there with conflicted emotions. He knew that what she said was absolutely correct to some extent. A few years later, unknown cavern, Shuriken was still physically unconscious but his mind was a hub of activity. He was feeling new things, new powers. Slowly, as his power increased, and he started to reach closer to Minashiki's power, his speed of absorbing the natural energy increased. But he was not just absorbing the energy of Minashiki, also his body's experiences, the fighting, the use of various ninjutsu. He was getting them all, except his memories, However, he was confused about something else. Hmm. Is this weird thing keeping an eye on me? It does look humanoid, but I'm certain it's not a human. He had noticed this strange white creature inside the ground, keeping an eye on him. I must deal with it as soon as I wake up, he decided, not knowing that the creature in the ground was thinking the same thing. He focused on looking out. He was trying to develop the ability to focus on one direction and see faraway locations too instead of seeing things around in a radius. Ah, uh, what is going on here? So many adults have surrounded two kids. Shuriken came upon a scene while randomly looking around. Wait. He suddenly sensed something familiar in the girl. His heart became happy immediately. Finally, after so long, he finally found one of them. I suppose. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. But Shuriken saw the ashen-haired boy punching the girl with Isabu in her body with lightning. It made a hole in her chest. No, no. I can't let you die, Isabu. There is no telling when you will reappear. Shuriken focused on the closest tree to that location and controlled it with all his might. The tree immediately grew taller than any tree in the jungle, and its roots spread out everywhere. He made the sand go soft, and the girl's body disappeared in it. In there, Shuriken sent one root directly into her heart. Because as long as she lived, Isabu would too. Isabu, can you hear me? Shuriken tried to communicate. There was no sound. Shuriken continued to move the girl's body underground, towards his location while calling the name. Isabu, Shiru, a scared and familiar voice came back. Yes, yes, it's me, you're Shiro. Shuriken's voice bloomed immediately, sounding happy and tearful. He finally found a lost part of his family, after so many years. Isabu was also very excited and happy, really? You are okay? A.H. I'm so happy. You saved me. But how are you doing this? Hee <laughs> hee, I have grown very strong, Isabu. I can control nature, like it's a toy. But I am still stuck inside that crystal. It will take me a few more years to completely destroy Minashiki. Until then... I will have you to talk. Shuriken said joyfully. Isabu affirmed with his voice. Yes, yes, we will be together forever now. But don't hurt this girl. 
I was forcefully sealed in her by the enemies of her village, so she can be sent to her village and throw me out to cause rampage. Shuriken felt sad for this child. The shinobi world has truly gone insane, sending children to war. I will straighten it all up once I'm out. I will have the needed strength for that too. Ah, uh, by the way, did you meet anyone else? Isaba chuckled. I was in Kirgakure, Saiken is there too. He, he only talks about you and his milk farm. He misses you a lot and worries about you too much. Anxious while thinking if you are even alive. Shuriken teared up. Just a little more, we will be together once again. Lightning country border. The war was in its last stages. Kanoha was preparing for the confrontation with the lightning country. Namike's Minato took on A and Killer B. Killer B had control over the Eight Tails to some extent now, so he was causing too much damage. But Kanoha's side did not have a tail beast to rely on. Minato had to use his speed to fight them. But there was one good thing, a team from Sunagakir was also there along with the Jinchuriki. Sunagakir tried to use their one tails against Kimo. They knew that the more they defeat the enemy, the more advantages they will get at the end negotiation tables. In the end, both eight tails and one tails came face to face. But in the middle of the fight, the one tail went out of control and started raging around. Killer, we had to focus on containing the one tail, or else it would cause a lot of injury to all sides. BM, Yuki punched the raging Shikako. But just as their bodies contacted each other, the two giant beasts paused as if the time had stopped. In fact, Yuki was having a conversation in the mind with Shikako. Fool, calm down. Don't you want to know what happened to Shiro? Shiro? Shikaku stopped all his anger and became attentive. After all, Shikaku had been the one to go away the first and get caught. He didn't even know what happened to his siblings and Shuriken. Yes, after you went away and didn't return, Kurama felt guilty and went out to find you. But something happened. He was caught by Kanahagakur and sealed just like you. Shiro then decided to head out himself. One thing led to another. He found out that Hashirama Senju wanted to seal all of us in people and sell us to villages. But at that same time, an Atsutsuki from space attacked. Shiro and he got sealed in a crystal thing. I threw him away to keep him safe until he got out of it. So hold yourself tight. Shiro will be coming soon. Until then, just pass your time. Don't senselessly kill people. It will make them hate us more when we are freed again. Do you want to kill all the humans in the world? The old man would not have approved of it. Yuki reasoned with him, but now Shikaku was angrier at Kanoha. He was also shocked that Kurama headed out to find him. These humans, they disgust me. Shikaku angrily roared. The next moment they started moving, Shikaku stopped being violent and stopped allowing his Jinchuriki to use his power. Meanwhile, Gyuki did the same and just told Killer B that this is not a fight of tailed beasts. Minato went on to defeat Kumobikure that day and gain an immense reputation around the world. This was the action that made the fire country daimyo feel Minato was a better candidate for the Hokage position. Eventually, the war ended. But just before it ended, all villages except Kanoha came together to commit one last war crime that would put all else to shame. Shuriken saw it with his own eyes because this happened in a village under his nature vision range. It was a very peaceful village, with its people not even participating in the wars. They were still very strong, however. The village was called Yuzushiogakure, the home of the Uzumaki clan. Due to the formidable powers possessed by this clan and their ability to seal anything, ranging from chakras to living and non-living things. All the other villages loathed and feared them, with the exception of Kanoha. This was despite them never using their powers for evil. The other villages planned the genocide of the peaceful Uzumaki clan. The poor people, in the end, were betrayed by Kanoha too, who were considered to be the closest ally since the days of First Hokage. Senju and Uzumaki 
were sister clans after all. They were left to fend for themselves against the might of not just four of the five big shinobi villages, but also smaller ones. The formidable sealing techniques were too scary for them to tolerate. Shuriken saw the armies advancing towards the village. He could not stop this genocide, but he could warn them. Using a tree's roots, he etched words on all walls of the village that they will be under attack by other shinobi villages soon. Most did not take the warning seriously, but some did. They left their village as quickly as possible to settle in faraway places, going as far as to dye their hair to disguise themselves. But 95% of all people in that village were massacred that day. They tried to put up a good fight, but in the end, they could not win. The so-called shinobi were animals. They killed all, from old, young women to even newborn children. Some other war crimes, such as essays and tortures, also occurred. Shuriken used his tree's roots to kill as many such criminal shinobi as possible. He saw everything with his senses. Slowly, he felt he was getting numb to human life. They were supposed to regard each other with value, but here he saw it. One human killing another just because they feared each other. Why did you not teach me this was the true nature of humans. Shuriken asked Aisabu. Aisabu sighed. We didn't want you to become like them, Shiro. We wanted you to be better. How will that be helpful if I am the only good person in the world? How will my people Minari Jean and our family survive if we only show kindness? In a world like this, our kindness will have no value. I'm glad I was stuck here for this long. I saw the world for what it truly is. Now I know what I must do once I'm out. Shuriken replied with emotional pain in his voice. What would you do? Kill them? Won't that make you the same? Isabu asked. He was hesitant about Shuriken's goals now. Shuriken denied, as you all taught me, that a bad apple spoils the bunch. So yes, some of them might need to die, but my goal is not death, but life. The true reason for their misery is their disunity. They don't see each other as fellow humans, but divide themselves as clans, villages, and skills. But then, how will they divide themselves when there are no borders? When their feudal lords are my puppets? When they don't get permission to wage wars? Aisabu felt proud that they all were able to make Shuriken grow up into such a reasonable being. They felt all their flaws were missing in Shuriken. He was the best of all of them. Then I am with you, and I am sure everyone in the village is waiting for you. Isabu supported his decision. A few years later, Shuriken and Isabu talked to each other to their heart's content. Shuriken wasn't aware, but Isabu knew that it's been more than 50 years since they all were separated. A.H., just a little more. Look at him. His body will probably turn into ash at this rate. Shuriken noted the condition of Minashiki. Shuriken's body had changed a lot by now. It was very muscular. His eyes were still red though, and his white hair had grown longer. His height had reached more than six feet. His body was brimming with so much energy that he felt he could just swat away beings like Hashirama now. He he, Isabu, I think I can easily beat Kurama in a one-on-one -on -one physical fight now, Shuriken claimed. It will make me very happy if you do beat him. We all know he's the strongest among us, even though we never acknowledge it because it would make him more arrogant. You beating him would teach him a good lesson. Isabu was all into the plan. I guess now I have another reason to find Kurama. Okay, let's see outside. I will probably be out of this thing in a few months. Shuriken's ability to see around had increased to 300 kilometers. He could now see many small and big human villages. There were so many activities going on. He also occasionally saw some shinobi fighting. He felt that he was one with nature now, gaining an understanding he never did before. He could see through the trees, ground, water, sand. He was truly a being made of natural chakra, the natural energy. How will you get me out of this girl? Isabu asked him. By untying the seal holding you in simple, Shuriken answered. But Isabu warned him quickly 
that will kill the Jinchuriki immediately. I don't know why though. Maybe Gyuki would. Then we'll find someone who knows about seals. A.H. Look, there's something in the river near the cave. Shuriken exclaimed. Isabel looked along with him, since they were both connected through the root in the girl's heart. It's a boy. Why are his eye sockets empty? Isabu wondered. Shuriken changed the water flow and brought the body towards the bank of the river, from where the sand and the trees took over. He brought the body inside the cave and checked it with his nature sense. He's alive, but dying. Hmm. I don't see any other sign of injury on him. It's as if only his eyes were taken. Someone took them? Isabu wondered. Shuriken shrugged with his voice. Who knows, people are strange around the world. Maybe we can get some answers from him later when I get out. He looks old enough to know things. So Shuriken put him in a tree on life support that would keep him alive. At the same time, Shuriken noticed the movement under the ground. It moved when he saved this body. I must kill this thing as soon as possible. It's too creepy, he thought. Crack. Ah, Isabu, it's breaking off. Shuriken excitedly cheered, seeing the crystals showing the signs of breaking. Just then, the body of Minashiki moved and his eyes opened. He spoke in a dying voice. Ah, it took me so long to get out of that illusion. You, I may have lost, but they will come to find me, and then you will see your end. We, Shuriken heard his last words before Minashiki's body went limp. It became lifeless, and yet his body still had energy. One year later, crack, crack, under the shining moonlight of that night, a being was returning into the world where gods were a myth, where human life was a joke, meant to be played with by strong ones. The cracks were slow and silent, but they were going to shake the world in the coming future. They were like a silent warning to the world that your chances to correct yourselves are over. Crack! Shuriken felt the crystal become loose around his body. The body of Minashiki was nowhere to be seen now as only the clothes were left. It was finally time for his physical body to wake up. Like the flames of the sun, the two eyes opened wide, the crimson color illuminating the crystal as if it was made of blood. Boom! A punch broke out from the crystal with a loud sound in the ever-silent forest. Boom! Another punch blew half of the crystal away, freeing the left side of the body. Hiya! Shuriken spread his arms wide in a split second, destroying the crystal into smithereens. His upper clothes were gone, his body growth had tattered them away, but his pants were there as they were loose to begin with. His iron-like muscles were visible for nature to see as he looked left and right, seemingly not in control of himself. Bang! The next moment, all of a sudden he plunged his whole right arm into the ground and pulled out a white humanoid thing. His crimson eyes and expressionless cold face looked at it for a brief second. Splash! His mighty hands squeezed its skull as if it was a lemon. The red blood splattered around the cave but not on his body. He took a tiny breath in and then blew out a small amount of fire, burning the body to ashes. He also burned all the remnants of the crystal and the clothes of Minashiki. At last, he looked up. His face seemed bloodthirsty now. Wake up, Shiro. Isabu tried to communicate with Shiro, but couldn't. He knew that Shuriken's physical body was still in shock as it had gone unconscious just after being caught in the crystal. To him, the pain of losing his family was still as strong as that day. This is bad. I hope he comes out of it quickly. Isabu prayed, but he was stuck in the girl's body and couldn't do anything. B.E.M. Shuriken jumped out, piercing through the ceiling of the cavern. He appeared directly above the trees, his eyes looking towards the closest sign of activity that he could sense with his inhuman abilities. The moonlight fell on him, lighting up his snowy hair and body, with the crimson eyes giving an aura of danger. This was not the sweet little Shiro. This was a natural calamity. It was 9 p.m. at night. 
The jungle was as silent as a graveyard. The animals also quietened down, sensing a predator roaming around. Shuriken, still in his maddened state, zoomed through the forest, jumping from one tree to another, crossing hundreds of meters each second. His mind was empty, with no emotions on his face. But internally, the real shuriken was slowly returning. The automatic reaction of his body would slowly stop. In the closest village to where shuriken was stuck, it was a village of humans, the first village shuriken had noticed. The one where poverty and sickness ruled. The one where shinobi exploited the people. There weren't many young people left in the village as all died during the wars and some while hunting for food. The village a while ago relied on trade, but wars destroyed the economy, and as there was no traffic of traders or travelers, they never earned much. In fact, during the wars, because of the lack of supervision on shinobi of all villages, small villages like these became the places to plunder and steal. The little food and money they had were also taken away. At the periphery of the village, mostly the poorest people lived, those that couldn't provide any value to the village. These included older parents of dead adult children and small orphans. Grandma here drink water. One uncle said that you could get better. A cute little five-year-old girl in dirt rag-like clothes brought a glass of water carefully out of their small thatched hut. Her grandma sat outside, looking at the stars with her hazy eyes. While the little girl looked full of life, the old woman seemed hopeless, because she knew there was no better future for them. Someday, her granddaughter would grow and become just like her. This was the fate of all those who couldn't contribute to the village. And her fate was decided the moment her son and daughter-in-law died. She tried to keep the little girl happy, so she smiled and took the glass. She was sick. Her body ached every day. She knew her time was close, and it scared her to think what would happen to the little girl. There were more beasts in human skin out there than real actual beasts. They would shred her little granddaughter to pieces. Grandma, today I learned to write my name. Big brother from the big house taught me, but for teaching me he made me carry water from the river for him the whole day. She cutely sat by her grandma's feet tiredly. She was talking about the son of the village leader. The whole village's wealth was collected into his family alone. Since he had money, he had hired people to protect himself. He just tried to keep the village alive rather than happy. The village leader's son usually made the poor kids do harsh work for nothing in return. As seen by the little girl, even just learning to write her name was a treasure to her. Grandma, my birthday is coming. You gave me a dumpling last year. It was very tasty. Can I get one again? Please. She innocently requested. What would a child know about poverty? All she could do was watch some other kids be happier than her and some even sadder than her, as they don't even have a grandma. She could only wonder why she could not be happier. The old woman caressed her hair, not replying to her. She didn't want to make promises she couldn't keep. Whoosh. All of a sudden moonlight stopped falling on them. She looked up, there was a man, tall and mighty, his body casting a shadow on her. His crimson shining eyes filled dread in her heart. W, we have nothing, please. She muttered, feeling resigned. Shuriken's arm slowly rose towards her. The little girl saw him and quickly stood in front of her grandmother. No, don't hurt my grandma, she shouted. The red eyes turned towards her, looking at her intently. Inside Shuriken's mind, the consciousness was returning with the memory of all that his mind saw in all these years. The little girl shrank herself back in fear. Brave girl, Shuriken spoke in a light voice. Slowly his eyes started to turn less aggressive. His arm was frozen in its place, twitching slowly. Pieti, dumplings are indeed very tasty. He spoke, and all of a sudden a kind smile appeared on his face. He looked around to see where he was, 
That was a close one. If I killed a child today, I wouldn't have been able to forgive myself. This place seems like that village. He looked at the old woman and put his hand on her head. Be well, child. Using his powers, he healed the stomach tumor that was killing her and then rejuvenated her body with a small influx of natural energy. The old woman felt warmth all over her body. Her eyes teared up and she fell from her chair on her knees. Thank you, she whispered. Shuriken turned to the little girl. Come, won't you show me where the village leader lives? He asked her with a deadly smile. The girl felt shy. She blushed and nodded. I will, big brother. She grabbed his hand and started happily leading him. Shuriken knew the real criminals, the real monsters of the village. The reason why Shinobi continued to harm the people, the reason why no Shinobi village received the complaints, and the reason why only a bunch of people here were rich. He saw all of this with his nature vision. Along the way, Shuriken saw many sick. This was a slum, and people lived harshly. He would put his hand on each person for a second and move on. Every time the person would fall to their knees and start crying, thanking him. Shuriken soon arrived in the center of the village. There are a few well-developed buildings stood erect. By now he had made a big enough fuss to alert all the people these rich men had hired as guards. Shuriken, without saying a word, just waved his hands towards these muscular men and they fell unconscious. This was something that could only be done on normal humans as they didn't have chakra. It seems all village rations went to these men's bellies. Who are you? No shinobi is allowed to create a mess here. A man shouted. Probably the village leader. Shuriken sighed. Reasoning with a boulder was as good as throwing your head on it. Shuriken raised his right arm towards the man and forced him on his knees. Confess. He ordered, looking down into the man's eyes, as if the man was nothing but a little insect under his feet. W, who are you? You shinobi think you can hurt us, and we won't say a word. What are you doing, everyone? Beat him up, he wants to hurt you all. The man tried to provocate the people, but most of them did not move, as they just saw Shuriken's miracles. Confess, a lot of people spoke at the same time, the man still kneeling, felt like crying. He was trying to guess who this shinobi was. What? What do you want me to confess? I did nothing. The man replied. Shuriken felt frustrated and made the man fly 50 meters in the air. Confess or fall to your death. I didn't D. A-A-A-A. He started falling. The ground continued to get closer to him. He would certainly not survive this fall. I sold villagers to Shinobi. I kept the money and food aid from the daimyo. Meant for all villagers. That was all that was needed. His crimes were too heavy, and Shuriken had seen so much bloodshed for human greed that he had no sympathy for him. You are no better than those Shinobi who harm you. It's better if you become fertilizer for the plants. Slash. A tree root pierced his body, spreading blood around and dragged him into the tree trunk. Unlike other times, Shuriken didn't keep him alive, instead let the plants devour him and use his body's minerals. He looked at all the people, they had no leader now. They would be unorganized if left like this. I will return in a day. Those who want to go to a better village, my village, stay here and those who want to leave, do it before then. He announced, whoosh. Slowly, his body rose into the air. An innate ability of Atsutsuki was flying, and with the use of natural energy, he could do the same fairly easily, even more so after becoming so much stronger. As he flew up, all the people on the ground started to bow to him and called him a god. Shuriken didn't reply and just flew away. I am no god. I am what you all were supposed to be. Shuriken arrived back at the cave, much to the happiness of Isabu. Sorry, Isabu, I was confused for a while. It's all good now. Sai, I was worried you would do something in that state. Good, you are back. Now, let's go and find the rest. Hee <laughs> hee, I can't wait to once again be at home. Shuriken nodded. 
We will. But until then, I will use sealing scrolls to store all the bodies. I am very hungry and need to find a place to eat first. Good with me, I can talk to you even then, as we are now connected with your natural energy. Isabu affirmed the plan. So he went on to store the bodies of the two boys and the girl in a ceiling scroll. Next, he flew above the clouds to get a better view. A.H. I see a big city in that direction. He exclaimed, Drop, drop. I like this rain. It refreshes me. Let's geolo. Shuriken enjoyed the feeling of the wind and rain hitting his body. After so many years, he was getting to move. It felt like the best yawn of his life. Flying must be fun, Isabu enviously said. He could not experience all this physically. Shuriken laughed. Haha, it is. I can't wait to fly with Minari and Jean. While talking, Shuriken soon arrived in the same village he had been to once. This is Kanahagakur. Kurama should be here somewhere. But you need to leave him and Shikaku for the last. I want all of us siblings to see you beat them. Maybe even we can beat them a little for making such a mess. Isabu suggested. Shuriken chuckled and accepted. Fine with me, it won't take me too long to bring you all back anyway. Ah, uh, look, this shop looks decent. Ichiraku Ramen? I hope they sell dumplings. In a cheerful mood, he took a seat by the table. The man behind the counter seemed a bit shocked, though, as Shuriken was still shirtless and his well-defined muscles were highly intimidating. Kid, will you give me your best ramen? And do you sell dumplings? He inquired. He was basically everyone's senior, a being more than 200 years old now. Twitchy instinctively nodded, but his little daughter, Ayam, was blushing and blurted loudly, Yes, we have dumplings. Ah, such a cute little helper. Then give me ten plates of dumplings. Also, pack one hundred plates for takeout. He ordered his food. Tucci didn't mind being called a kid. He saw the big money now. He was pumped. Coming right up, the ramen came first. The whole night sky, with rain, elevated the atmosphere and increased his appetite. Hmm, this looks tasty, but... Shuriken smiled kindly, and without uttering a word slid his bowl to his right, which was an empty seat. Actually, there was no customer there except him. But Shuriken sees everything now. He saw a drooling cute little blonde boy with whiskers on his face, probably no older than eight or nine, who wanted to come into the shop but was short on money. So he just looked at the steaming bowl of his ramen. Kid, give me another bowl. He called Tucci. Tucci looked at what happened to the last one. He just paused there with a big smile on his face. The little orphan boy was slowly coming towards the counter where the bowl was put. His smile was worth watching. Tucci looked at Shuriken's face again. Although his eyes and body seemed intimidating, his smile reminded Tucci of a harmless, pure and kind person. He felt elated that such people still existed. Once again, feeling pumped, he shouted, Coming right up! Can I eat it? The little boy asked Shuriken. With a big smile, Shuriken nodded. The boy then jumped onto the seat and hurriedly started devouring the ramen. Here you go! A bowl of ramen and ten plates of dumplings. Tucci put his food on the counter. Instead of using ten plates, he just put them all on a single bigger plate. Finally... Shuriken clapped his hands and started devouring, not much different from the little boy beside him. One by one, he ate all the dumplings. They are very tasty, only second to those my family makes. Thank you for making this for me. Tucci smiled. Someone suggested I add this to the menu a long time ago. It grew upon me since then, and I started enjoying making them. But ramen is still my speciality. Then I should thank whoever that person was. And yes, the ramen is also very tasty. He continued eating, but then he noticed the blonde boy staring at him. His bowl was empty. Haha, want another one? He asked him, to which the boy only nodded frantically. Um, give him another bowl. I am in a very good mood today. Where are your parents, boy? He inquired. 
The little boy all of a sudden turned sad. His shoulders fell, and he got depressed. Then, with a meek voice, he replied, I... I don't know. They died during the nine-tailed demon fox's attack. Shiro also became sad as his body stiffened. His heart ached to hear this. Only if we were not separated. Don't be sad, Shiro. Even I killed many people. You can't imagine how it feels to be locked inside a prison for so long against your wishes. You become angry, and whenever you get a chance you try to release that anger out. As even our anger stays trapped inside the seal, Isaba told him. Sigh, he patted the boy's head with a kind smile. Then you are just like me. I don't know who my parents are either. I never saw them. Hell, I don't think they even existed. Anyway, what's your name? I am Naruto Uzumaki. Who are you, Grandpa? Naruto asked. He was back to his jolly mood, feeling a bit better knowing he wasn't the only one feeling the same pain. Shuriken's eyes flickered, due to his long white hair. Naruto mistook him for an old person. Well, he was right in a way. Shuriken was old enough to be the grandpa of everyone's grandpa. I am Shuriken Dama. You can call me Uncle Shiro. Here you go. Tuchi put another bowl in front of Naruto. All right. Uncle Shiro. Naruto cheerfully went back to eating. Shuriken did the same. He has immense chakra, but why is there a seal on his body? Could it be? Shuriken wondered while eating. Clap, thank you for the meal. I should go home now. I will start the academy soon, so I need to keep myself fit. Hey, you did that. And Klesuro. Naruto jumped from his seat and ran away in the rain. Once Naruto was gone, Tucci gave Shuriken another plate of dumplings on the house. I appreciate the kindness you showed him. Poor child has a very harsh life. Shunned by everyone, even the children don't play with him. So, he's the Jinchuriki of Kurama now. Poor child, Shuriken deduced and felt bad for him. Then who takes care of him? He inquired. Tuchi sighed. No one. The Hokage just gave him a small apartment to live in. He also gets a little money allowance. But how can you imagine a child to know how to manage it? Tucci was not just some random person who took pity on Naruto. He was formerly a member of Team Jiraiya, a member of the team in which Naruto's father was. How could he ignore the child of his childhood friend? Author's note, this info is non-canon and just a hypothesis. Truly, it's a strange world we live in, where real monsters roam free and children get ostracized. Shuriken muttered and started to take a scroll from his pant pocket. Clank, here. Feed that boy until he starts earning money. And this one for making such delicious dumplings. Shuriken put two whole gold bars on the counter. Tucci's eyes popped out. He had never seen such an outrageous customer before. But then his mind replayed the words once a girl had said. One day, someone will come who loves dumplings. He can make you rich. Is this the one? Tucci wondered. Shuriken got up, his face suddenly turning serious. What's your name, child? Uh, I'm Tucci. I am 28 years old by the... Shuriken started walking away. It's going to be a very dark night, Tucci. It is raining red. You better shut down the shop. Tucci wanted to ask what happened, but Shuriken just vanished. He felt a very ominous feeling rise in his heart. He quickly turned to his teenage daughter. I am quick, prepare to close. Shuriken jumped from one roof to another, slowly heading towards the edge of the village. His nature sense, author's note. For the sake of readers, I will make MC speak some words that he already knows due to his senses. Was on, and he saw all that happened in the village, since it wasn't bigger than his max range. But he couldn't look inside chakra-induced seals or restricted zones. Strange, no guards are in this area. So, this was a government-organized act. Shuriken deduced. He entered an enclosed area. It seemed to be a separate district from the rest of the village. Achiha symbol. He entered the place, and after every few meters, he saw a dead body. They were lying there, lifeless on the road with wounds and blood oozing. The street was painted red, 
Then his eyes fell on a house nearby. Its paper sliding doors were also red. The people in the house were dead, that was for sure. Why would anyone kill so many people? He wondered. This was exactly why he hated the current state of the world. The lack of care for life was astonishing. Slowly, he came upon the bodies of even children. They were probably outside with their parents. The little bodies mostly had wounds on their backs, telling a tale of what happened. They must have tried to run away in fear. Was this necessary? For whatever reasons the murder had, he wondered. Help. Shuriken heard the girl's voice coming from not far away. He hurried to there in a second. Whoosh. He took out his sword. Tenken. The snake sage inside, it was still sleeping for some reason. Shuriken slowly walked forward, letting his presence known by all living people in the vicinity. There was a masked man in front of him, having chained a girl. Ah, uh, so it's another Uchiha killing his own clan. Two, actually. I wonder why. He spoke softly. Whoosh. The masked man jumped back in fright. He had not sensed this presence at all. He looked at Shuriken's intimidating form and couldn't help but gulp. This is what the badass overpowered character in comics used to look like. Long white hair fluttering in the air. A tall and muscular body with every single muscle trying to scare the enemy away. The masked man had read his fair share of comics and knew that when such a character appears, you should run. But he didn't want to take those comic plots as real possibilities. They were planning to cause far more damage if not stopped. The man replied, trying to justify the killings. Shuriken scoffed. And killing them was the last option? Killing all of them? Even the children? Run. Run away. Quickly. The white Zetsu's voice fell in the masked man's ears. Why? He's weak. There is no chakra in his body. The masked man replied to it. The white Zetsu cried. He's the one I told you about. The person you should stay away from. If you fight him now, your death is imminent. And what makes you think he will let me go now? The masked man asked back. Just use Kamui. Whoosh. He did exactly that. The man started to vanish from the spot in an invisible spiral of air. Shuriken shook his head. Not so fast, boy. Bang, with a sonic boom. His body reached the spiral of air. He put his hand directly into it as the masked man had nearly disappeared. Shuriken started to pull him back. These tricks won't work on me, boy. He proclaimed and started dragging his leg back towards himself. Soon the masked man felt his leg about to tear up into two. Eh. The masked man tried to fight to get free, but he couldn't. So he decided to directly teleport to his partner in crime for the day and vanish with him. In a large house, a boy stood behind his parents. Both faced their backs at him. The mother had tears in her eyes and the father pride. The boy's hand shook as he held his blade against their backs. His eyes teared up. Thrust, thud, two bodies fell, lifeless. But it was a quick painless death. That's all he could do for them. Whoosh. The masked man appeared in the room suddenly and jumped at the boy. But he stumbled too as his left leg was unusable now. Shuriken had also arrived there. But he had let the man go as he didn't want to be teleported to somewhere too far. We need to leave. The masked man shouted and grabbed the boy's hand. They started leaving together through the same method. Wait up. Shuriken grabbed the boy's arm. But the boy then looked at Shuriken with tearing eyes. Red Sharingan visible. There was a deep pain in them. Something that such a little kid should not, could not have known by ordinary means. As if the boy had just died while living today. Whoosh. He let the boy go. The dead were dead. The living could be helped now. He just needed to do this. As for the two Uchiha, he could catch them any time later. What was important was to handle the situation here. Sigh, these must be his parents. Why would that child do such a thing against his own clan? His tears obviously meant he had feelings for them. Then why? Shuriken wondered. 
Shuriken saw that none were left alive, except for that girl he saved outside. He wasn't sure she was alive though, because she wasn't moving at all. He returned to her by flying and tried to talk. She turned out to be fine, but she was devastated by what she saw tonight. She was crying continuously, looking at the bodies around. Her parents were most likely killed today too. Mother! She muttered and ran towards her home. Shuriken hovered behind her. When she entered her house, she just passed out, seeing how gruesomely her parents were killed. She was, after all, just a 13-year-old girl. Get used to this suffering little child. This world is full of it, he said with a sigh and picked her up. If this was an attack sponsored by the administration, then she was not safe here. He still needed to find out where his home was though. He believed that Minari or someone else should have at least left a clue for him somewhere. And the best possible location was the old village, Woosh. He flew away at a great speed. But first, he stopped at the ramen shop and took the dumplings he had ordered before. Sealing them in a scroll, he left. He did not go to the village he saved first, instead. He went to the old Dama village. So many memories tied to this place, Isabus spoke. Shuriken nodded and looked around with a heavy heart. Once I take over, I will create the new Daimyo Palace here. This place will become immortal then. Shuriken started looking around for clues. The whole place was just filled with greenery now. Nature had taken over. If I was Minari, where would I keep the clue? Hmm, she knows I love dumplings. Ah, uh, wasn't there a dumpling storage here? Shuriken exclaimed and rushed in. BM! As soon as Shuriken opened the door, he saw a big bear sleeping inside. He chuckled. At least someone's utilizing the space. The bear woke up from the noise, but didn't feel threatened by Shuriken, because to it, this human felt the same as a tree. It's okay, keep sleeping. I will leave in a while, he said, and looked around. One drawer after another. One box after another. He was looking for them everywhere. Dejectedly, he went to where the garden used to be. There was only grass now. He just roamed around looking at things. But then he noticed something strange. Wait, why is there tea in the garden and also a teacup? Ten seconds later, he came to one conclusion. There is a tea country, right? So that's where they went to. Shuriken left the bear undisturbed and headed to the village he saved. While flying, he saw the place where he fought Minashiki. The whole giant crater had now turned into a lake. The trees too had grown back, most likely the work of Hashirama. He descended into the village he saved. The people there were expectantly waiting for him. Many who had money had left already. Mostly the dirt poor ones were left as they didn't have anywhere to go and no money to afford to move. Don't call me God. I am just a person with some special abilities. Just call me Lord Dama as that's what all my people call me. Now let's move. We are headed to tea country. Do you have any animals here that can pull a cart? He inquired. Out of 200 people, only five had bulls. Shuriken just made some carts for them, put the luggage on them, and start following me. Then he went to the small girl from before and handed her a small box of dumplings. It was her birthday soon after all. She was on cloud nine with such a small thing. Really, when you have nothing, little things can make you very happy. Shuriken led them on the long journey to a better land, cutting the rivers in half for a passage, bringing shade of trees whenever the sun decided to torture them, made a cool breeze blow around to keep them refreshed. The Achiha girl, however, had gone mute. She was awake, but she wasn't speaking or moving, probably due to the shock. Kanahagakur, the aftermath of the whole massacre, was obvious since it was commissioned by the village heads. But it came to the knowledge of the Hokage that an unknown white-haired man was present at the scene, and he scared the murders away. It brought headaches to the village leader for what was an already complex situation. They decided to keep this thing a secret, ordered by the Hokage himself. But 
Some people had different plans. Tea Country, the Daimyo Palace, was in the middle of the country on a high hill overlooking the Kanashiai Ocean. The country was now fully run by Jean as the Daimyo of the land. The economy was booming as they did not allow anyone to create a monopoly on the business. Also, the trade incentive schemes made not just the people more excited in trading, but even the foreign traders. Hence, Tea Country was slowly turning into a hub of trading all kinds of goods. The Nidma clan had now increased its numbers to 900. All of them were born with super strength and long lifespans. Something in everyone's DNA had changed, but nobody knew what. The clan ran the country, with its wisest members being assigned governors of different newly created provinces in the country. This made administration much easier. Jean, stop with all those papers and for God's sake, and hold the baby. Minari angrily barged into the office. Jean turned to his wife. Minari had returned to the village a few years back, with her search for Shiro unsuccessful. She just left behind a few clues for him to see and come here when he comes out. As decided earlier, she wanted a child now. So she made one with her husband. It was a boy. His name was Shirajin. Minari had named him after the two most important people in her life, Shirakin and Jean. I was just finishing my work, and he's already one now. You don't need to always be around him. He is much stronger than those already strong babies of our clan. Jean said and picked up his son. The little boy had the hair and eyes of his mother, while the rest looked like Jean. The strangest thing about the baby, though, was his eyes. He was born with one Tomo Sharingan activated. Minari, for what she knew, understood that such cases were not normal. Kids are not born with Sharingan activated. So she just gave more care to him, to make sure no mishap happened. Do you think we should take him to the Uchiha clan once, so he can learn the techniques there? Jean asked her, not that he was in favor. She scoffed, huh, never. Shiro can be the best teacher our baby will ever need. Is there anyone else who can do the things he can? Anyway, did you find out about all the Saint Beast's locations? Jean nodded, I have. I have found Krama, Shikaku, Gyuki, Matatabi, Saiken, Son Goku, and Kokuo. I am yet to find Isabu and Chome. I just hope they are fine. Me too. Minari sighed. BM. All of a sudden the door slammed open and Jin's assistant ran inside. Lord Daimyo? Ash, he's back. Who? Is it the head of the Wasabi family? I told him I will not accept his requests. Jean replied, No. Lord Shiro, he's back. The man shouted on top of his lungs. His face showed happiness akin to a child. Thud, it was not the baby, just a file from Jin's hand that fell. Minari was also in shock. She hurriedly asked, Where? He was seen at the border of Fire Country, crossing over to here. He had a group of 200 people with him. He looks so different now. Lady Nidama. He looks like a god. The man babbled in worship. Whoosh. Jean and Minari dashed out. They didn't need to hear this man's nonsense. They ran at full speed to the country's boundary. They were very strong and running at a speed not visible to human eyes was normal. Though Jean was slightly slower than Minari, they even brought their son together, who was now throwing his arms in the air due to the excitement of this fast ride. In just 20 minutes, Jean and Minari arrived a few kilometers away from the border. A large entourage of people was walking on the road. In the lead was Shiro, slowly hovering in the air and flying forward. He was still not wearing anything on top. His white wavy hair flew around with air. His face seemed so kind and calm, but his crimson eyes were violent and powerful. Whoosh. Jean and Minari jumped out of the tree line and stood just a few meters away from Shuriken. Minari was teary-eyed. Jean too. The whirlpool of emotions was moving their hearts. Eshiro? Minari asked. He looked so different now. 
Before, he had the charm of a kind boy, but now he had the charm and presence of a strong man. What the assistant from before said is right. Shiro did seem like a god with his overbearing presence now, although one could not sense him. If you look at him, you will feel the thickened invisible aura around him. He slowly stopped flying and walked towards her. Yes, this is your Shiro. Monday through Monday, Minari teared up. She searched for him everywhere in a maddening state. She spent years searching, only to be disheartened in the end. She always felt that she was useless for not being able to find him, and it was a weight on her heart. Sniff, why are you shirtless? Shuriken smiled. I decided to dress to impress. But you're wearing nothing above, she replied, slowly walking toward him. He opened his arms wide. Exactly. I'm back, my dear sister. Minari hugged his chest tight. She just realized how tall and big Shiro had grown. The last time she saw him, he was smaller than her. But this gave her a sense of pride. This was her brother. This was her Shiro. Shuriken also felt very emotional, and his eyes filled up. He hugged her tightly. I missed you all. He looked at Jean and opened one arm to hug him too. Jean ran in immediately. They were childhood friends after all. The three hugged each other for a few minutes, muttering about their past, the happy days of old times. P but then Shuriken felt someone touching his hair. He looked up, and there was a baby on Jin's shoulder. The moment he looked at the baby, he knew who he was. He laughed loudly and hugged his two friends slash family tightly. Ha 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 ha. Thank you for giving me such a cute nephew. Without asking, he let them go and picked the baby in his arms. I am Uncle Shiro and we are going to be the biggest dumpling enjoyers in the universe. I, uh... The little baby gave his nod of approval with a light pat on Shuriken's face. Truly, your home is where your family is, not a house or a village. Uh, it's so good to be back home. Shuriken felt this happy and satisfied for the first time in decades. Shuriken didn't allow the new people to become a part of his clan. The Nidima clan didn't accept people out of anywhere. The people he had saved were made to set up their new village. The normal people of Tea Country were confused why so much celebration was going on in the Daimyo Palace district. It was decorated to the brim. Lots of traders were invited to bring some special goods and food. The whole Nidima clan was cheering and laughing like they had all hit a fortune. Unknown to them, they really had hit a fortune. Because Shuriken was their de facto ruler, their leader, and their protector. With him around, they did not need to worry about anything. Shuriken was also in awe when he found out they had already taken over the country. On top of that, they had made a magnificent castle as well as the capital city around it, though mostly the Nidima family lived there and operated many businesses. It was more of a financial capital along with being an administrative capital. People wore good clothes there, Horse carriages also looked beautiful, carrying people around. The tall pagoda-styled buildings gave it a very peaceful and yet modern feel with their catty paint. You really built a very remarkable place, Jean, Shuriken said in praise. He was currently sitting in the daimyo's office with Minari, Jean, Fumiko, and the old village elder present. Jean smiled. After we lost the village, I wanted to create something that would surpass that. A new memory we could all hold on to. Now that you are here, I can finally retire, and you can take up all the responsibilities. Shuriken quickly waved his hand. No, no, that's not going to happen. I have different plans, Jean. First, let me tell you all that happened to me when I was stuck in that crystal. I was constantly watching everything around me. The pain, the deaths, and the misery I saw. I have a new goal now. I have the power, Jean, and if I don't use it now to change the world, I will not be able to sleep at night. He told them everything about the wars, about the deaths, about what he saw in Kanoha not long ago, how the shinobi villages were still at each other's throats, always trying to start a new war, 
He gave the example of Kyrgyzkir, which was still being called the Bloody Mist, for their practices and cruel methods. Then what are you planning on doing? Fight them? Minari asked. No, contain them. You understand that these shinobi villages and their kaga are not the supreme authority in their lands. Daimyo, although weak and powerless, holds absolute authority. They can stop giving the shinobi village money, stop their trades or even the missions, but they are normally so weak that they are afraid of even raising their voices when the shinobi village does something wrong. But in most cases, these daimyo are so detached from reality and so corrupt that they don't care about what happens to the world as long as their existence is ensured. And the shinobi villages always send some people to guard the daimyo whenever a big conflict is going on. This is so the shinobi villages can ensure their own survival. I am going to bring every single daimyo in the world under my thumb and declare myself the supreme daimyo of all the lands in the world. What can the shinobi villages do when their daimyo has agreed to my appointment? Maybe some will try to challenge me or assassinate me. They can try, and it will just give me more reason to strike back at them harder. So are we going to take a hard approach or a soft approach? Jean inquired. Shuriken got up and looked out of the window of the room. This daimyo castle was very high and overlooked the vast ocean. Both. We will use both approaches. Except for Kanahagakur. Other villages don't know anything about me or the clan. So, before they even realize what's going on, I will be done with my work. But, I suspect there is something more mysterious going on. There was a strange creature that was keeping an eye on me. Isabu said the creature looked somewhat like something he had seen in the past. I will have to investigate that as well. What about the Saint Beasts? Fumiko inquired. After all, these beasts were like beloved gods to them. Without them, the family would always be incomplete. I will get them back too. But I need to find a way to extract them without killing the Jinchuriki because in most cases, the Jinchurikis had no choice as they were kids when the bijou were sealed in them. However, I'm sure there are some bad seeds too. I will kill them and take out the bijou immediately. Shuriken planned. He was not against violence, as it was a necessary evil. He was just against killing innocents. Sigh, then I will have to continue to work as Daimyo. It's going to be exhausting. Jin muttered. Shuriken went to him and placed the little Shuriken on Jin's lap. Don't worry, I will not let you get tired too much. I don't want Minari to complain that she does not get any alone time with her husband. Hey, I never complained, Minari yelled. Jean chuckled. Really? Are you suggesting something else? She looked at him with narrowed eyes. Shuriken burst out in laughter. Haha, <laughs> stop you too. Anyway, if we are going to celebrate, why not make toys in the shape of all the same beasts? Make them look cute. I'm sure all the children and women will love them. This way, we can slowly create a new generation that does not fear them. And when we finally have all the bija back, they will be able to roam around without worrying about scaring someone. Clap, that's a bright idea, I will make sure they look as cute as possible. This is a man's promise. The old village head, Rakamatsu, nearly 160 years old, shouted. Ever since he had gotten stronger and started exercising, he had fallen in love with bodybuilding. Now he looked buffed but still old. He had found his second youth in this old age. The old man even wore glasses now because, in his own words, it looks stylish. Author's note. Just imagine Master Rashi, but without perversion. But what will we tell the country? They need to know why we are celebrating this day. Fumiko voiced. Everyone thought hard. Then Minari just shrugged. Just tell them that we are celebrating the return of a very strong ancestor. He's old enough after all. Wait, are you calling me too old? Shuriken faced her with false anger. She looked away, maybe. Come, Shuriken, I will show you the funny songs your old uncle used to write. But 90% are about dumplings, so you might fall asleep soon. Shuriken chuckled. Hehe, <laughs> she hasn't changed at all. 
She's just too happy with you back, Jean said, standing beside him and putting his hand on his shoulder. Welcome back, Shiro. We were worried if you'd even come back in our lifetime, no matter how long it is. You should go out and meet the clan members too. It will make them happy. Jean advised. I will, Jean. But I need to wake up a few people that I had saved before. Where is the medical center here? Jean took him to their well-developed medical center in the palace. The doctors here were not ninjas. Instead, they were Nidima clan members. They practiced and researched intensively on animal bodies and dead human bodies, slowly learning about the art of operations and healing. They were still learning, though. Shuriken suggested something. Maybe later I can get you some medical ninja scrolls. They should help you to some extent. The doctors were elated hearing this and bowed to him. Shuriken was then taken to an empty room by Jean. There, he put the scroll on the table and opened it. Poof! The body of the boy that was missing an arm and leg appeared. His wounds were non-existent now. Even his face was somewhat healed with only a few scars left. Shuriken made the boy wake up. He was in a coma for so many years now after all. The boy's eyes quickly opened and he started breathing very fast. Calm down, you are safe. You are alive. Shuriken tried to ease him. The boy probably remembers the events just before his death, as if they happened a second ago. It has been 35 years since that event took place. Will you tell me your name and where you are from? I will take you to your home. Shuriken offered him after a bit. But even the prospect of going to his home didn't excite the boy and his eyes seemed as hazy as before. Now that his shock had subsided, the boy seemed to be a statue. Snap, Shuriken snapped his fingers in front of the boy's eyes. They didn't even flinch. He still seems to be in shock from the trauma. I guess he will not be moving around. I have already healed him physically. I don't know why he's like this now. Maybe he needs some time to get used to. Shuriken put him in a wheelchair and took out the next scroll. In this one, the boy with no eyes was stored. His body was also in a coma for the past year. He didn't know about this boy, his eyes were missing, and there was no way to tell if he had woken up, though he was indeed moving a little. Are you awake? Shuriken asked. Fire release. Great fireball technique. The boy all of a sudden shouted, and released a giant fireball from his mouth. It was big, much bigger than all the people Shuriken had seen do in his life. Maybe not bigger than Minari though. Shuriken didn't even flinch and put his hand on the boy's mouth, absorbing the whole fireball by converting its element into natural energy. Calm down, boy. It's been years since you fell in the river. I saved you from there. What's your name? Shuriken asked him in a calm voice. Who are you? The boy asked. He knew better than to give away his name so easily. I am Shuriken Dama, head of the Dama and Nidma clan, and by my side is Jean Nidma, the daimyo of Tea Country. He's a good friend of mine. Now you tell me about yourself. That's what basic courtesy is. Shuriken replied. The boy stayed silent for a while, most probably weighing his options. In the end, he realized that he was stuck. His fireball didn't even make the people move, and he could not see either. I am Shursue Achiha. So, Shursue, how did you end up losing your precious Sharingan? Shuriken asked him. Minari also arrived at the same time. Shursue was now wearing a blindfold over his eyes to save the sockets from getting infected. He was in a much calmer state now. I... What happened to my clan now? He asked first. Dead. They were all killed by a boy and a man in a mask, Shuriken replied. Hearing this, Shursue's face contorted. I did not want this. I wanted peace and coexistence, but had no option left. The Achiha clan was planning to rebel against the village, because we were seen with suspicion ever since the Nine Tails attack. Everyone thought we controlled the beast. I... I knew that if the Uchiha clan rebelled, we would all die a very gruesome death. But not before damaging the village as a whole, and even starting the fourth shinobi war. 
I wanted to use my men Gekyo Sharingan's ability, Koro Mitsukami, the technique that allowed me to enter the mind of any individual within my field of view and manipulate them by giving them false experiences, making it seem as if they were doing things of their own free will. It is regarded as a Gen Jutsu of the highest caliber, due to the victim being entirely unaware that they are being manipulated. But before I could use it, I was ambushed and my eyes were taken from me. This is all I can tell. I do not want to sell the village secrets to someone I don't know. As long as I am alive, I will be a Konoha Shinobi. Shursway told his story, albeit incomplete. But Shuriken didn't mind and neither did he care. He did not save the boy for his eyes, clan or intel. He just did it because the boy was injured. Ha ha ha, you can rest easy, child. I know more than you do about your village anyway. Maybe not about the current events, but I did meet both your first and second Hokage. They were scums to be honest, with a very myopic and distorted view of peace. Your second Hokage was the one who started the Konoha police, wasn't he? And he made Achiha do the job, and this created more distrust in the public for them. Your village was meant to fail from the start, as its foundation was based on friendship, but its entirety of existence only saw hatred. Anyway, you are welcome to stay here if you want, or if you want to can send you to your village, but you will most likely get killed there, so choose your options wisely. Now, I need to meet another Achiha. Shuriken left him, heading to the girl he had saved. Minari stayed though, she didn't meet many Achiha anyway, and there weren't many left now. Know this, the Achiha clan was destined to fail. They tried to kill me once when I was small, just because I overheard some of them planning to kill their lord. I was just ten back then. They killed my family when they couldn't find me. A clan that does not have each other's back is not worth being a part of. She bellowed. Shursway was surprised that there was another Achiha here. When did all this happen? Um, I think 80 to 90 years ago. She replied, But this shocked and confused Shursway. That's even before the formation of Kanoha. But you don't sound old. She chuckled. I am old in the number, but not the body. We are a clan of special people with special abilities. You will understand when you can see again. Have rest until then. In the next room, Shuriken was talking to the little 13-year-old Achiha girl. She was in a state of shock and sorrow. She was hugging Shuriken's waist from her bed and crying loudly with no end in sight. Wea. Shuriken patted her head. Easy now, I know your pain. Why, why did Itachi do that? I thought he was kind. It does not make sense. She muttered. These are the answers you must work hard to find yourself. Itachi is still alive after all, he suggested. Sniff, sniff, she held back her tears and nodded. Yes, I must find him. I will go now. He held her in her seat. A boy who could kill the entire clan of Uchiha would be so easy to stop. Are you strong enough to stop him? Won't he just kill you at first sight? She seemed to realize it now. Desperation seeped into her. Suddenly her eyes started to bleed, and the three Tomo started to revolve around. Shuriken knew this was the evolution of her eyes. Then, all of a sudden, the pattern changes. A flower-like design appeared in her eye, with five red dots in the middle of it, surrounded by a circle of leaves. A.H. What's happening? She screamed in pain. Calm down. You just awakened the men Gekyo Sharingan. Just try not to use it or it will turn you blind. He advised her with a straight face. Nothing shocked him anymore. Not after fighting a literal alien from space. She knew about this legendary Sharingan, but never thought she'd have it herself. But her focus was now on getting stronger to find and catch Itachi. I want to go back to my village. Izumi requested. Steps Minari entered. Sure, go ahead if you want to get killed. She was then told about the Uchiha massacre and the possible hand of the Hokage in it. Initially, she refused to accept it, but when she was taken to the now blind Shursway, 
she accepted everything. She was young and not a very strong shinobi, so she never knew about the planned coup of the Uchiha clan. Now, she understood why Itachi killed the clan, but how could she just accept the murder of her parents, the kids of the clan? Sure, Sui tried to calm her chaotic mind. I hope you are not angry with Itachi. He had no choice. It was either kill the clan or let it start a war and then get slowly killed with the hatred for the Uchiha clan increased to the limit. If you want to blame someone, blame all sides. What happened was not the result of just a few weeks of tension. It came into existence and increased ever since the defection of Madara Uchiha. Sure Sui told her he knew Izumi a little. After all, to him, Itachi was like a little brother and it was obvious he would know the girl his brother was interested in. Then, what are you going to do? She asked Sure Sui. Sure Sui had no answer. I don't know. I am nothing without my eyes. Maybe I can use Susanu, but that's it. For now, I will stay here and try to understand this strange country. This place sounds so strange. And Lord Shuriken is supposed to be hundreds of years old, yet he sounds so young. I wonder who these people are. Cough! I am still here, Shuriken voiced. Sure Sui was probably unable to sense him and thought there were just three people in the room. Sure Sui got shocked. I... I didn't... It's okay, I don't bite unreasonably. You talk to each other. I will go out now. He left them be, at the moment he had for people here. Three of them were from Kanoha, but the small boy in a coma was still unknown, and the girl with Aisabu was also asleep. Shuriken went out to see the capital that had been made to honor the village of Dama. As he got to the streets, each Nidima clan member would cheerfully greet him or try to show him what they do in the village. It was fairly easy to recognize a member of the Nidima clan, as all clan members had some extra visible muscles and were taller than the average person. This goes for female and kids too. On top of that, all of them wore an armband with nine dots, interconnected with lines and all of it surrounded by a circle. It represented the nine saint beasts and the halo of Shiro's medical abilities on their heads. But as Shuriken started to get to the outer regions of the capital, he saw people from different backgrounds. But the most striking ones were a lot of redheads. Wait, are these people from the Uzumaki clan? He wondered. He went and straightforwardly asked an old-looking Uzumaki, sitting by a small shop. The shop was crowded with customers, but the family of the old man handled them, while he sat outside and looked at the busy streets. Shuriken sat beside him on the bench and kindly asked, when did you all from the Uzumaki clan arrive here? The old man's eyes shined when he heard that. Shuriken immediately knew this old man, had nobody to talk to for a while, and now had finally found an opportunity to speak to his heart's content. The old man described everything he saw during his years. It turned out he was one of the few who left the village after Shuriken had warned them of the upcoming attack. We were hopeless back then, we had painted our hair black and were roaming around from one village to another together in search of a place to start a new life. We just wanted to live in peace and never even use our sealing techniques again. But we found out that some shinobi from a few villages were still after us. So we kept moving, ultimately deciding to leave the country. In the beginning, we were not led into the tea country. But when Lady Minari came, she talked to us and understood our pain. We found out she was the wife of the Lord Daimyo of this land. Understanding our pain, they let us build ourselves a home right in this district and even let us open shops to trade. Now we sell our sealing jutsu scrolls and special weapons to buyers from around the world. And we are under protection from Lord Daimyo and Lady Minari. She even beat up some Kimo shinobi once when they tried to harm us. Truly, we used to think Kanoha was our truest ally and friend, but our true friend turned out to be someone we didn't even know. He told his story with great enthusiasm. Then I wish you luck in your life. I hope you will feel at home here. Shuriken wished and started to leave. 
It sure is like home, with a bit more fresh air. The old man replied, while looking at the blue sky. Shuriken then checked up on the people he had brought with him. To his assurance, they were being treated well. They were first given health supplements, and then divided into groups based on their skills. Of course, families were kept together. Orphans were sent to government-run orphanages, and children with an old guardian were put on social welfare until the child grew to start earning. School education was free in tea country, though. They didn't need to worry about money, as their trade relations were strong, and they were making huge money on small taxes they imposed. The tea country was, in all words, the perfect country. It goes on to show how a few people who lived for years in a peaceful and kind environment can change things around them. Shuriken let them celebrate, and he went back to the castle to start doing his work. He wanted to go and save Saiken, as he felt the need to save that farm boy first. Saiken was also the kid's favorite plushy toy in the market. It was made with a soft cloth and cotton filling. Kids loved to play with it and also sleep while hugging it. Real Saiken was also very friendly, so if you were to come here first, people will surely start feeling different about the tailed beasts. I will be leaving for Kirigakure. Aisabu is already with us. It's time we bring Saiken too. I don't like the culture of that place. Kids being forced to kill each other to pass exams. Shuriken spoke in disgust. Then let's go. Minari was ready. Shuriken immediately denied. No, you will stay here and shower Shuriken with love. I don't want him to grow up and blame me for never receiving a parent's warmth. Trust me, I know how that feels. She wanted to say something, but a glance at her son stopped her. She would never want her child to hate her or Shiro. I won't let you go alone. What if you disappear again? I need someone to at least inform us every once in a while about your status. Jean voiced his concern. They didn't want to lose him just after getting him back. Well, I don't have any way to contact you remotely. Maybe I can try to throw a rock all the way here. But it might injure someone or break something. Shuriken suggested this absurd idea. And nobody really doubted him. Maybe you really could throw the stone all the way from water country. I can help you. Sure Sway entered with the help of Izumi. He was still getting used to not seeing things. How? Minari asked. I can control crows. I can send them here with your letters. Sure Sway suggested. But Shuriken denied this help. Sorry, but won't I have to constantly protect you? I am not going on a journey to have fun. I will be fighting whole shinobi villages by myself. By the time we reach Kirigakure, I will learn to see through my other senses. I promise I won't be a burden, and if I am in danger, you don't have to save me. I am already a dead man for the world. Sure Sway firmly said, Sai, stop being so suicidal now. If you can tell me who took your eyes, I can get them back. But you won't tell me, right? As it's a secret of Kanoha, Shuriken stated, The thinking Sure Sway had, that his village came above all, was the exact thing he was trying to change. I cannot tell that. It will jeopardize the safety of the village. Sure Sway replied, Hmm. I hope you open your inner eyes soon and see the world for what it is, instead of the propagandish glasses of Kanoha. Come with me now. We will leave immediately. Let me show you how great this world is. He ordered. But Sure Sway had different reasons to come along. He wanted to understand Shuriken. He had heard enough rumors by now about him, and he wanted to confirm them. Wait, take me with you. Lady Minari said you can help me get strong. Izumi clamored, but Shuriken outright rejected her, saying, No, I am not a babysitter. You are not strong enough to survive where I am going. First, learn to fully utilize your three Tomo Sharingan and then the Mangekyo. When you have done that, I will help you. Remember, do not make revenge your life's goal. Make it your strength. He didn't want to be too hard on this girl, though. She just lost her clan and her parents to the boy she liked. He ruffled her hair, 
to convey the message that he was not a very upright serious guy. He can and will help her as long as she has a strong enough will. From the years of seeing the humans fight each other, one thing he learned was that the only ones who should be helped are those that deserve to be helped. Because sometimes, while helping someone stand up, they bring you down along. Let's get going then. Oh, Gene, prepare a big farm for Saiken. I'm sure he misses his previous job. He suggested. After that, he headed to the port, and from there he took a boat. He didn't bring anyone else on it. Only him and Shursue. It will take us months on the boat to reach Kirigakure. Shursue guessed. Shuriken chuckled and waved his hand. A sudden gust of wind pushed the boat further. It kept on repeating and soon they were cutting through the sea. How are you doing this? I didn't feel you use any kind of jutsu. Shursue asked. Shuriken laughed and took a seat by the steering wheel. It's a secret. I will tell you mine when you tell me yours. Then how old are you exactly? This shouldn't be a secret in the village, right? Shursue asked another question. Hmm. I stopped counting after reaching 200. Shuriken replied and started to heat some dumplings he had packed for the trip. There were about five big drums full of dumplings of all kinds of flavors. Shursue was shaken a little. From what Izumi had described, Shuriken didn't look older than your average man in his 30s. And why are we going to Kirigakure? Especially this Saiken person, he inquired. Shuriken burst into laughter. Ha ha. To think you people declared them mindless beasts before even asking their names. Shamelessness knows no bounds. Saiken is the six-tailed beast. They are my dear family, and they were forced to become your shinobi nation's prisoners and war slaves by Hashirama. But how can beasts raise you? Shursue was unable to comprehend how the mighty and dangerous tailed beasts could take care of a baby. Say whatever you want. The fact is, you people know nothing about their origin, their lives, and their feelings. They are beings older than all the clans on Earth. They tried to befriend humans, but were shunned by them for their giant size and sometimes scary nature. But let me tell you, they are the gentlest creatures who also crave love and compassion, like any other being. What would you do if you were locked in a seal that restricts your movement? A seal that contains everything, your feelings too, for years and years? Won't you be angry? And won't that anger compile into that seal until it breaks? They don't care about humans or villages or clans. They just want to be left alone and live happily. Is that too much to ask for? Look at their condition now. They have been forcefully turned into weapons of mass destruction. Now that I am back, I will not allow my family to be hurt like this, ever. This was Shuriken's declaration, that if these humans keep on putting their villages above all else, then he won't be gentle with them. He has limited patience after all. Shursue was listening to him keenly. He agreed with all of his points about the tailed beasts, and if they really were as intelligent and compassionate beings as Shuriken said, then the shinobi world was indeed wrong. But he picked a small line Shuriken said and asked, Back? Where were you? No, no, no. No more secrets from me. Besides, if I tell you, you might just lose the will to live, knowing how powerful the real enemy is. Here, eat some dumplings, get energy, and become a big strong boy. Shuriken warmly advised him, handing him the plate. I'm already 17, just so you know. Sure Sway reminded him. He didn't like being called boy. Shuriken laughingly patted his head. Hee hee. To me, everyone is a kid. Even your Hokage. Now eat. Shursue sighed in defeat and ate silently. At least he appreciated Shuriken's kind nature. Not many would be kind to a blind boy in the current world. Just a few hours more till our destination. Then we will go on foot over the water. Our boat has a distinct style that can be easily traced. Shuriken estimated the time of their arrival. It just took them one day to reach this place. Shursue had been silently practicing to sense his surroundings. The training was coming along pretty well. He was trying to hear through vibrations around him, 
but it was getting hard as there were just too many. He had been trying to sense shuriken now, and except for his physical existence, he could not sense anything related to Chakra in him. How will he fight the whole cure cure without Chakra? He wondered. Shuriken was packing slash sealing all the leftover dumplings across. To eat them later when never required. He had nothing to do during this time, so he was trying to understand his powers and to what extent his control of natural energy went. Oh look, Land. Let's walk there now. Actually, I have a better option. Get off the boat. Sure sway. Shuriken decided and jumped off. Sure sway also followed the movement behind carefully. Boom. Shuriken slashed his hand towards the boat, and a strong air current broke it in two. It soon sank into the sea. Next, he went beside Sure sway and caught his shirt from the neck. Ah, uh, what AR? Before he could complete his words, he felt his feet touching nothing and just hanging in midair. He felt his body rising up and up with every second. Shuriken chuckled. I forgot to tell you, I can fly. Very sage-like, isn't it? YWN Tenken. The snake in Shiro's sword woke up finally. Oh, what did I miss? And you don't look like a sage. Sages are supposed to have long white beards and bald heads. You are the opposite of them. Shuriken shook his head in disappointment. Decades have passed. We are back again. And now we're going to Kirigakure to save Saiken. Really? I felt like I just closed my eyes. Tenken replied, Because you were used to sleeping in that box in the past. You are really useless. I don't even know why I keep you beside me anymore. Shuriken said in a condescending tone. Tenken immediately woke up. I was just joking. I am your humble servant, my lord. Don't throw me away. Where is this voice coming from? Sure Sway finally asked as he came over the shock of flying. Well, more like being carried around. It's my sword. A sage snake is stuck inside it. Shuriken revealed. Sure Sway silently tried to sense the sword on Shuriken's back. He had no idea how a sage snake came to be stuck inside that thing. Shuriken carried Sure Sway until they reached the land. It was a secluded part of the shoreline. The shinobi were not always present everywhere. They just stay in their village. Daimyo didn't have enough people to guard the boundaries either. Hence it was likely that nobody will know they were here. Where to now? Sure Sway asked, secretly taking a sigh of relief, feeling the ground below himself. Shuriken took out a map. Hmm. My aim is not conquering Kirigakure, but to punish the water daimyo and bring the whole country under my influence. Let's go to the daimyo castle first. So Shuriken headed to the nearest road, but they made sure he was not so fast to leave Sure Sway behind, which he could easily do. He would be as good as dead here if left like that. Can't believe this kid is blind. He's running like he's having a good time. Tenken muttered, I hope you will also carry me on your back, like I'm carrying you right now when I get you out of this sword, Shuriken said. Hey, find a summoning beast if you want to ride. I am a proud sage snake. Tenken protested. Hmm. I wonder which animal I should make my summoning beast, Shuriken started thinking. Clank. While he was busy thinking, out of nowhere a shuriken came and struck him. But it clanked on his skin as if it hit metal and fell down. What? Did someone attack me? I thought it was a mosquito. Shuriken looked around and immediately increased his range of natural vision. Ah, uh, so I was indeed attacked. Who are these two? He muttered to himself. Whoosh. What happened? Who attacked us? Sure Sway landed near him with his sword out. Calm down, boy. We will find them soon. Don't worry at all. Just follow me. Shuriken dashed in a direction. BM along the way, he saw a lot of traps, but even though they got activated, they couldn't do any harm to him or slow him down. He kept on running in a direction while making a lot of foot noise for Sure Sway to easily follow him. A.H. Got you. He yelled and jumped out of the tree lean. Tang, Shuriken's sword clashed with the other man's sword. He was a tall and noticeably muscular man with light grayish skin 
Short spiky black hair, dark brown eyes, and small eyebrows. He was wearing bandages like a mask over the bottom half of his face. He wore his Kirigakure forehead protector sideways on his head. He was shirtless, with his chest only covered by a belt to which he attached his massive sword. Wearing baggy pants, with the striped pattern typical of Kirigakure and mimetic wrist warmers, extending up to his elbows, with matching leg warmers. I've never seen this fashion style before, Shuriken muttered with a smile. Shuriken was pushing the man with very ease with just one hand, while the man was making rageful noises, trying to use all his force and yet failing to stop Shuriken. H.A.A., who are you? The man asked. Shuriken stopped pushing him and caught the giant sword by its sharp blade. It was a large broadsword, as tall as a full-grown man, shaped like a butcher knife. The blade itself has two cutouts, a circle close to the top and a semicircular one nearer to the handle, the former of which is aptly fitting the sword's purpose of decapitation. This is no place for a little child to roam around with such a deadly weapon. Tell me your name first. Shuriken demanded. D. The man suddenly jumped, leaving his sword and taking out a kanai from his pocket, directly jabbing it at Shuriken's neck. Shuriken let him do it. The best way to defeat an overconfident person was to destroy their self-confidence. Ting, the kanai's tip broke down. The man felt danger and wanted to jump back. He had just taken a step back when Shuriken lifted his hand and grabbed his neck in midair. Enough games. Tell me your name and why you have a child with you. You don't look like his father to me. Shuriken asked him. The man was gasping for air, and he squirmed. I... I am Zabuja Momohi. The man finally answered. Hearing the name Shuriken remembered food. Machi? Rice cake. Zabuza? Demon of the hidden mist. Sure Sway exclaimed. Whoosh. Out of nowhere. A nice spear appeared with great speed, aimed at Shursway. Watch out! Shuriken shouted, and also threw Tenken, matching the trajectory. Boom! The ice spear shattered, and Tenken was plunged into the ground a distance away. Triple A? My blade got dirty. That was what the snake sage screamed. Shursway was shocked. How could he not anticipate this? It was all on his mind. Be careful, sure sway. You almost just got killed by a ten-year-old. Hey, little one, come here. See, I'm not hurting Zabuza anymore. Shuriken politely tried to talk to the boy hiding behind the trees. Don't be scared, Haku. Remember what I taught you. Zabuza yelled at the little boy. Slap. Shuriken lightly backhandedly slapped Zabuza. Don't be mean to him. He's so small. Come here, child. Look, I got lots of sweets. Haku slowly came to him. He was scared of Shuriken and hid behind Zabuza. Here, Shuriken offered him some candies, but the boy didn't take them. Who are you? Zabuza asked him calmly this time. Shuriken kicked the ground with his right foot once, and in an instant the trees moved close and changed shape to make a shelter, table and chairs for them. Come sit. I am Shuriken Dama. I come from the land of tea, now called the land of Dama. My clan is a pretty secretive one, and don't be disheartened that you couldn't beat me. Not many people in the world can make me sweat anyway. Uh, are you too hungry? Just wait here, I'll get some dumplings. Hey, help me here, Sure Sway. Sure Sway bit his lips and walked to him, still thinking about the situation before. His blindness was causing too much problem when it came to sensing fast-moving objects. You didn't have to save me. I told you before not to worry. Peter Shuriken ruffled his hair and scoffed. I am not like you shinobi, who don't see anything beyond their village as something worth saving or helping. To me you, this little haku boy, or even a stray animal are the same. Every living creature has a right to a peaceful life on this land. Didn't your grandfather sacrifice himself to save his friends? I really wish a man like that was Hokage instead of the current one, or that foolish Senju. Anyway, come and help me, and stop thinking negative all the time. Just think that you died once, and now, 
This is your second life. Do you want to waste this second chance thinking about the past or work hard to make a better future? Think wisely. Shuriken left him standing at the edge of the wooden shed. Shursway was a bit shaken by those words. He wondered if he was even allowed to have a second life. But one thing was true, that Shursway truly started to respect Shuriken. Shursway was very kind, lacked arrogance, and was a very down-to-earth individual. He was very open-minded and stated his opinion on any matter. But that never stopped him from listening to others and finding flaws in his own ideology. And with observation, he tried to remove his own flaws. Is my ninja way wrong? He wondered to himself. Is it tasty? Shuriken asked with a bright smile. The little boy, who looked a lot like a girl, nodded his head while chewing the dumplings. His mouth was filled with them and looked bloated like a chipmunk. Hee <laughs> hee. Good to meet another dumplings enjoyer. Shuriken patted his head. He had made sure the kid sees him in a good light this whole time. Now, although Zabuza was still tied with a rope on the side, little Haku was not very agitated. Why have you even caught us when you are not going to kill us? Zabuza asked him. Shuriken shushed him. Do you want me to make you unconscious again? You refuse to tell me why you have this child with you. And unless you tell me, I won't let you go. Sure Sway silently nodded. He was acting like a henchman of Shuriken. At the same time, Tenken's sword was placed in front of Zabuza to keep an eye on him. I, I found him by the roadside. That's it. Zabuza finally revealed. Shuriken glanced at the boy happily eating. He asked Zabuza, Do you know what happened to his parents? Haku's mother was a wielder of a Kekiai Genkai ice release. He is from the Yuki clan, so you can guess what happened to him. Ha, huh. his mother so foolishly hid this fact from her husband, hoping that the love and peace that was shared in their small family would last forever. One day, Haku discovered the ability to manipulate water. Amazed by this, he proudly showed it to his mother, who was horrified by what she saw. She tried to hide it, but her husband found out. His mother was murdered by his own father, who assembled a small mob of villagers when he found out. He also tried to kill Haku, but before he could, Haku used his ice release to create several large ice spikes to kill his father and the rest of the mob. He was wanted by no one and was forced to take to the cold streets and rummage through trash bins for scraps of food even sometimes having to fight off the wild dogs that roamed the streets. Then I found him once begging for food. I recognized his ice release powers and made him my weapon. Zabuza told him the whole story. Bonk, Shuriken smacked his head. You did well by taking him in, but very bad by trying to make him a murderer. He's not a weapon, look at him, so kind. But strength reigns supreme in this world. And for that, he needs to get stronger. Not to kill, but to protect what's rightfully his. And I heard you tried to stage a coup in your village? What would have changed after you had won? Shuriken inquired from Zabuza. Zabuza spat at the mention of his village. That's no village. It's a thug house. What village makes its young students kill each other to graduate? I would have banned all the violent practices after winning and become the Mizukage? How would you have gotten acknowledgement from the Daimyo? He inquired. Daimyo is a spineless coward. He knew what was happening in the village was inhuman, but he was scared of interfering, fearing that the village shinobi will retaliate and kill him. I would have easily scared him. Zabuza confessed his plan. He was only confessing because he knew that there was no hope anymore as some shinobi protected the daimyo now. What about the tail beasts? Does Kirigakure have the six tails? Shuriken asked him. No, the three tails was lost in war, and the six tails Jinchuriki also defected from the village like me. But nobody knows where he is. Zabuza answered. TSK, just when I thought I was one step closer, this hate and violence create problems. You are not Mizukage material. You seem more like a selfish person to me. Maybe you care about that boy, but that's it. 
If you want to live, redeem yourself for your crimes. Come with me and liberate your village. Or stay here and die. Shuriken announced, this time sounding very serious. Zabuza gulped. He still didn't know who this man was, but he felt a strange power from him. What give you the right to judge me? If you are so supportive of lives, won't killing me be against that? Zabuza asked him. Shuriken looked plainly in his eyes. Yes, but I meant the lives of people like Haku, not you, who make a conscious decision to do terrible things. Your reasoning was virtuous, but your method was awful, and I have tried to be kind to everyone, but it didn't work. Now decide your fate. I need to start moving. Huh. You just want to use me as your pawn, right? You talk about virtue when you lack it too. Fine, I will redeem myself. Shuriken didn't reply and just released him. He went to Haku. Let's go, boy. Don't you want to go back home? But everyone hates me there. Haku scaredly replied, P.A.T., don't worry, I will be going with you now. And if anybody tried to harm you little Haku, I would feed them so many dumplings that they would burst like a bubble. Shuriken comforted him. He had deep sympathy for all the orphan kids, since he knows how sad it can get sometimes. For him, he had spent many nights looking at stars and wondering who his parents were. He never got the answer to it and just learned to live with it. But it was worse for kids like Haku, who saw his loving family being destroyed due to some stupid hatred. Haku had seen his dear loving father suddenly kill his mother and try to kill him, making him an orphan to live off on the streets, begging for food. If this didn't make any man's blood boil, then mankind needed a lesson in how to be a human. Really? Can I also go to the school there? Haku asked. No, Shuriken replied. He knew how long it could take for the current generation to forget the hatred and the next generation to correct the wrongs. Seeing Haku sad, he added, because you will go to another best school in my own country. It is far in the southwest, beyond the sea. Do you want to go there with me? You can have many friends there. Really? Um, but I don't have money to pay for the school and the food. He said with a saddened face. He then turned to look at Zabuza. I, I will stay with my big brother Zabuza. I don't want to live on the street again. Nobody gives me money and they kick me. Haku said, remembering his past experiences, his eyes were on the edge of tearing up. Shuriken had no idea what this child had experienced, but he hoped that he wouldn't ever face that again. Shuriken sat down on the ground cross-legged. He held Haku's both hands gently and looked him in the eyes. I promise you with my life that you will have friends there, a warm bed and home to sleep in and tasty food to eat every day. But you must promise only one thing in return. TSK? Here comes the slavery part, Zabuza snorted. Haku was delighted to hear this offer. What promise? You must study with all your heart and be among the best in school. Can you do that? He asked. Sure Sway also smiled silently on the side, sitting while resting his back on a tree. Yes, I will be the first. Haku jumped in excitement. This promise was too easy to keep. Shuriken was happy and laughed. Ha ah, yes now, do you want to fly? Can I? Only sages can fly, I heard. Mom used to tell me stories about sages. Ah, uh, she said sages have white hair. Are you a sage too? Haku asked in shock. Ha, huh, of course he's a sage. He has me after all. I am the great snake sage, Tenken. Ha ha ha. The sword spoke loudly. Shuriken scoffed. Ha. Huh. There's nothing great about it. Haku from now on. Call that sword Chin Chinmaru. Haku nodded like the cute little behaved uh, boy he was. <laughs> Tenken was left speechless. W what? But didn't you say Chun Chunmaru before? I changed my mind. Don't you like this new name, Haku? Shuriken asked. Haku nodded. Yes, Chinchinru is cute. The sword turned pale in color somehow. This. 
See, chin chin means a male reproductive organ, right? Shuriken nodded with no reservations. No, it can't be. I demand to be thrown away at this very instant. Tenken shouted. Fine then. Shuriken lifted him up and prepared to throw it away in the air. Yes, throw me away. It's better to be in the hands of some random person than you. Tenken bobled. Sure sway. Isn't there just C in that direction? Shuriken asked his assistant. Sure sway nodded, sensing which direction Shuriken was facing. Yes, a vast sea is in that direction. Fine, here you go, Tenken. I will tell the white snake sage that this was your choice to live in the sea. Shuriken said his last words. Why, why, sword will fly. Haku was waiting to see how far Shiro could throw it. One, two, three, G. Wait. Fine. Chinchinru is fine. I will be your humble Chinchinru from now on, master. If this is what you are naming me, then I will be the best Chinchin out there in the world, goddammit, I promise. I will be strong, tall, and wild. All at your command. Tenken voiced in determination. Buffed. Sure Sway fought hard to hold his laughter. Even Zabuza was holding a snort. Haku was just confused. Shuriken threw the sword on the ground. He knew Tenken was saying this on purpose to make fun of him. You disgusting sword. Master, don't go. Don't leave your precious little Chin Chinru behind. Ha 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 ha. For the first time, Sure Sway laughed out this loud in his life. They traveled continuously. On their way, they saw a lot of villages, small or big. But one thing was very common in all. Food shortage and rampant disease. The climate of water country was humid, and this resulted in the growth of all kinds of insects. People were living a miserable life. Finding a fat man was like finding a needle in a haystack here. The condition was even worse for people in the internal areas of the country, where people couldn't fish. Shuriken used his wood release and control of natural energy to create lots of fruit trees for them. This won him a lot of goodwill, and they got to eat. Shuriken tied Zabuza with a rope and made him run behind them. He was seeing if this man cooperated or not. Till now, Zabuza was following obediently. Haku was made to sit on his back as he couldn't run very fast. The Daimyo Palace is on the other side of the water country. It shouldn't take too much time for us to reach there with this speed. Shuriken estimated. Are you going to attack the water country? All by yourself. Zabuza asked in interest. Sure, why not? He's a weak man after all. And how many people will be protecting him? Twenty? Fifty? They will not be an obstacle in what I want to do. Besides, we will be going in peace first, instead of our sword swinging. Shuriken said. His plan was simple. He will first talk with his mouth. If the daimyo does not understand, then he will talk with his sword. Sigh. I wish I had some kind of a way to evaluate how much of a sinner a person is, he silently muttered to himself. They dashed on the way for the whole day. When the moon started to illuminate the night sky, they saw a glimpse of a heavily lightened castle in the distance. It had a small town surrounding it, which itself was surrounded by a wall. It looks guarded, but manageable very easily. Okay, it's time to do an act now. I will be an old man. Sure Sway and Haku will be my grandkids and Zabuza, you'll be my kid. Now hold my arm and help me walk into the town. I will do the talking. Shuriken planned the fun little activity. Don't give me that face. Just do as I say. Shuriken scolded Zabuza. They will recognize me as soon as I walk in. He argued, whoosh. Shuriken took a tree bark and turned it into such fine threads that they started to look like hair. Take off your bandages. Ah, uh, now look, you have a beard and brown hair. Good enough disguise, I think. Haku, don't call him Zabuza as long as we will be there. Call him Papa and call me Grandpa. Call sure sway big brother. He instructed them. Haku excitedly nodded. Shuriken, meanwhile, made himself hunched. Then he took a stick and started walking. 
Zabuza annoyedly followed along. After a few minutes, they arrived at the gates. There were just two samurai guarding and checking the people entering the town. They slowly walked to them. Shuriken acted splendidly, taking each step with such weakness that he looked like he would fall dead any time now. Halt. Show your ID, and why have you come here? The samurai asked. Shuriken took out four cards from his pocket and handed them to him with a shivering hand. Ah, I am just an old man looking for a good wealthy buyer who can buy my precious family treasure. What treasure? The samurai asked interestedly. Are you sure you want to see it now? If it gets lost somehow, my son Hayabusa here will cry rivers. Shuriken said in a breaking hoarse voice. Zabuza's eyes twitched when he heard his new name and the thing about him crying. You are safe here, old man. Just show us the thing. We need to check it before you go inside. The samurai insisted. With a sigh, Shuriken slowly took out a cloth bag from his pocket and started to untie it. But it was tied in so many rolls that it was taking him a lot of time. That was exactly his intention. He wanted to make the samurai restless. So they let him in after getting frustrated. After 10 minutes of the slow unfolding of the cloth, he took a small box out. Behold, the most beautiful diamond you would have ever seen. He opened it. The moonlight fell on the crystal clear diamond and made it shine bright. The two samurai were enchanted by its beauty. Gulp if I give this to my wife. She will let me do it whenever I want, where I want, and however I want. I want to plant it in my teeth. The two unknowingly spoke out about their deepest desires. Whoosh. Shuriken quickly tied it back. You have seen it now. I want to show it to the daimyo, maybe he can give the right price. The guard seemed to be stuck in time and just looked at Shuriken. Grandpa, I want to pee. Can I pee here? Haku asked all of a sudden and started to slowly untie his pants. Hee hee, good boy. Shuriken patted his head. Yes, Yuka, if they don't let us in, I'm afraid you will have to pee here, Shuriken said sadly. Grandpa, don't worry, I will take him to the side. Shursue spoke up and ran straight into a samurai, ramming his body on the man. Thud. Ah, Yuzui, that's the samurai. Forgive him, Mr. Samurai, he's blind. Shuriken acted embarrassed. Grandpa, I will pee now. Haku also voiced. Fine. Just get inside already. Good luck with that diamond. The two guards finally got frustrated and let them in. They quickly crossed over to the other side. Shuriken was smiling at the successful act. When did you find the diamond? Shursue asked him. He he, I did not. It's not even a diamond, but just a small piece of crystal clear ice. It won't melt or break unless I want it to. Shuriken revealed. And you're going to sell it? Zabuza inquired. Shuriken smirked. Of course, we will dry the daimyo before I deal with him. Let's go to the palace now. I hope they let us meet once. I have a bad feeling about this bit of a plan. Shursue muttered but didn't tell them. A few moments later, hey, just let us meet him. Only for once. See, I got this precious diamond. I am sure the daimyo would love to have this one-of-a-kind diamond in his possession. Shuriken fought with the guards of the castle with his old voice. Old man, go away and come back tomorrow. Daimyo is having dinner right now. They tried to shoo him away. Shuriken made an excited face. Perfect. I can show it to him right now. Come on, do this old man a favor. He slowly slid down 100 Rio down the guard's pocket and winked. Fine, but if he gets angry and decides your existence is no longer welcome in the world, don't expect me to come and save you. Go now. The guard let him in with the other three. Shuriken went straight to the biggest door and entered from there. He soon found a maid and asked her for directions. After a while, he came upon a door, from whose other side lots of musical noise and laughter was coming. Shuriken looked at the rest. No need to keep the disguise now. Just go with the flow. I will still enjoy acting like an old man though. BM, he barged in rudely. 
the music all of a sudden stopped as everyone looked at him. Shuriken assessed the room carefully. There was a long table at one end, where at the far end was sitting the daimyo, then three people were sitting on each side of the table. They were eating a lavish dinner. Tens of roasted animals were placed in front of him. Dancers were entertaining them seductively. A.H., my lord, I am your humble citizen. I have come here to show you a great treasure. Shuriken enthusiastically started to untie the piece of cloth again. But even before he had started, the daimyo screamed on top of his lungs. Guards, throw them out. I told you not to let any lowly peasants enter my castle's inner grounds. Shuriken chuckled internally. He was testing this daimyo, and he just failed with flying colors. He falsely whimpered. My lord, I brought you a diamond. You can buy it from me. Huh. What can a peasant like you bring? Tell me how much you want, and just leave. The daimyo authoritatively spoke. Ten million Rio? Shuriken demanded. Ha ha ha. Do you know how many S-rank missions I can commission with this much money. Guards, they have wasted my time enough. Kill them and feed them to the pigs. The daimyo ordered. Immediately, a group of samurai surrounded them. Shuriken glanced at the daimyo and the rest eating beside him. All of them were looking at him with hopeful eyes. They wanted to see him die, and it seems they think it's entertaining. They even continued eating. This is all entertainment for them, he realized. He turned to Zabuza and ordered him with a whisper. Then in a second, Zabuza disappeared. Shuriken stopped his acting and stood straight. His height was more than any person there. He wiped his face and the fake age lines cleared up. His eyes shined red and a dangerous aura immediately took over him. So, this is what a daimyo is supposed to be. No wonder you don't care about the lives of your people. You are busy eating? while enjoying your life in such lavish dinners. Perhaps I should have never let you people establish countries. He started speaking while walking to the table. You speak too much. Kill him, guards. The daimyo screamed. The samurai all leapt to him. But, BM, he just did a 360 kick. In an instant, all samurais fell down to the floor, passed out with foam coming out of their mouths. Whoosh. He jumped onto the table and was face to face with Daimyo. Your time has come now, lowly Daimyo. My name is Bam. Before he could say it, Shuriken shoved Daimyo's face onto his plate. I do not care about your name. Your designation as the Daimyo defines you. And I am not satisfied with what you have done. You wanted to feed me to the pigs, right? Guess who's the pig now? Sniffing food like this. This country is facing a heavy famine right now. People are dying of hunger every day, and you dare to increase taxes just so you can enjoy these luxuries? Pathetic! Daimyo's face was pressed into rice and meatballs. He was trying to free himself, but couldn't even move Shuriken's arm. You. I have shinobi security. They will kill you soon. He tried to threaten in a muffled sound. Bang, a hot wave of lava touched Shuriken's face. He looked to his left, while keeping the daimyo at his place. Hmm. The shinobi protection squad, I presume? He asked the lady. She was young, maybe in her twenties. She was a tall, slender woman with fair skin. She has green eyes and ankle length, auburn red hair styled into a herringbone pattern at the back, a top knot tied with a dark blue band, and four bangs at the front. Let the daimyo go and nobody needs to be harmed, she offered. Shuriken slowly let the daimyo raise his face from the plate. You want to save him? This scum? This monster in human skin? It's my duty, she replied. B.E.M. Shuriken slammed the daimyo's head onto the plate once again, this time even breaking it. But he continued to rub the daimyo's face on the spilt food and made a mess. Sorry, but I refuse to recognize saving a human monster like this as a duty. May I know your name? He inquired kindly. The girl seemed to blush all of a sudden. I am Meitoromi, 23 years old. My figure is... 
She stopped as Zabuza suddenly entered with two large pigs. Shuriken clapped. Amazing. Now let's start the show. Daimyo and his lackeys. These pigs will be your entertainer for days now. W, what are you planning? The Daimyo asked in fear. Shuriken smiled, the light shining on his white face, making his smirk look utterly devilish. Now you will be eaten alive, slowly, of course. Enjoy. Let him go. Meiturumi dashed to help. Shuriken grabbed the overreaching arm of this Kunoichi and dragged her along. She couldn't do anything to get free. You will not interfere in this. All this is his own fault, whether you like it or not. What gives you the right to judge him? She questioned. What gave him the right to kill people? This is his country to run, but not his people to kill. If he can't do it right, someone else can and will. You're from Kirigakure, right? Do you like those graduation tests? Why didn't this daimyo intervene? Forget intervening. Why is the daimyo still affording all this? Of course, it's the money of poor folks. He questioned her back, leaving her in more confusion now. Mei was stuck in a loop of thoughts. She was sent here to protect the daimyo. But she also knew that the daimyo was a scum of a man and didn't deserve to have anything that he had right now. She also hated the bloody habits of her village. She herself had survived the now-banned infamous graduation tests of Ninja Academy in the past. She had to kill her opponent to pass or die herself. She had firsthand seen the violence, but she tried her best to not let the hatred change her heart and turn her like many missing means. She wanted to be the hope for her village. May had purposefully tried to develop her mind different from others. She was a kind and cheerful person, speaking well of others and attempting to avoid conflict. She was more open-minded than the other Kirigakure shinobi, as she had shown respect and was willing to listen to others. This man here is the feudal lord of the water country. He has the authority to do anything, to even dictate what goes on in your village. He could cut the funding to put pressure on them to change their violent ways, yet he did nothing. Here he is, enjoying each meal like there's no tomorrow, because he has money for himself, so why care? Shuriken said, But who are you? Why do you want to help us? Mei asked him, My family was taken by your Kirigakure. I have just returned to get them back, and I have the power, so I am putting the daimyo on the right path. He revealed, What family? I can help you get them back. She assured him, he chuckled. Ha, uh, you cannot. The person I'm looking for is a missing me now. Who is it? She inquired. The Six Tails Jinchuriki, Shuriken revealed. She was taken aback. Yo, Yudakata is your family. No, not him. The being locked inside him is my family. Hashirama, that maniac sold him to you, performing an act of slavery. Shuriken announced. Be but they are just beasts, she muttered. Shuriken scoffed. Forcing an intelligent being to do something against their will is called slavery. Now you can go back to Kirigakure and inform your village about this. Or stay with me and overthrow the Kirigakure government so a new and more peaceful one can be found. The idea was enticing, but she was not too sure. And what gives you the confidence that you can do it? You can try. Shuriken didn't even take a stance and just waved his hand to taunt her. The daimyo was still held in his right hand. May decided to take the shot. She ran at him and at the same time used her Lava Release Kekiai Genkai. Lava Release, melting apparition. A strong acidic mud flow came out of her mouth as she reached Shuriken. The mud fell on Shuriken, but he was unharmed. Eeeeee. The same could not be said about the daimyo. Some mud fell on him too, and now he was losing his skin. May instead of saving the daimyo physically attacked Shuriken with her kanai. BM, Shuriken caught her hand with ease and looked her in the eyes. I have nothing but pity and mercy for the innocents, but people like him, they deserve to die. Boom, whoosh. Eh, eh, eh. Shuriken threw a fireball at the daimyo's face. 
then a jet of water, erasing the flesh from his face, while the man cried in inhuman pain. Then a gust of wind came, slashing the body of Daimyo from various places, leaving him bloody on the ground. Get up, I am not done yet, Shuriken said to the Daimyo on the ground. Next, he just stomped his feet on the ground. BM. All of a sudden the ground lifted the Daimyo's body and made him stand up, albeit with support. Don't fall unconscious now. Let's wake you up. Shuriken pointed his finger at the man. Z z z z z. Bolts of lightning came out and woke the daimyo up with him screaming in pain. But now he didn't even look like a man. He was unrecognizable. Shuriken for the last time looked at the shocked face of Mei. You must be thinking about me. That this is such a cruel man. Fine. I will show him mercy. Shuriken put his arm an inch away from the daimyo's face. A green light all of a sudden covered the body. Then, in front of all, the flesh grew back on Daimyo's face and body. His wounds healed, and his face that was unrecognizable got healed. He soon returned back to the earlier condition when he was still eating. After watching all this, what did you learn about me? He asked Mei. The Daimyo was cheering for his life on the side. Mei was silent. She gulped, and yet her throat felt as dry as a desert. Why you have an affinity with all known five elemental transformations. Even the two nature transformations, yin and yang. WWHO are you? She understood how great such powers were. It is technically possible to master all five natures. It's just very rare because of how much training it requires. This was so rare that she even knows the names of shinobi capable of using all five natures which includes Hashirama Senju, Tobrama Senju, Hiruzen Saratobi, and Mu, the second Suchikage. Only Hiruzen was alive now. But what made her really shocked and awestruck was the fact that Shuriken had also mastered Yin and Yang. This practically made him godlike, since he could cure people like it was nothing. I have told you my name. Now it's time you tell me your choice. Are you going to join me and bring a better future for your village? or try to stop me meet your end, and not live up to see your village prosper? He asked her, but he put his focus again on the daimyo. What do you mean? Even if I die here, how will it prosper? Mei asked him nervously. Slap, shuriken slapped the daimyo. What he was doing was playing with the mind of the man. He was breaking him to make him his own pawn. Of course, I came to this country. One of the reasons was to put Kirigakure on the right path. Whether you live or die today, I will stop the bloody ways of your village. He declared. Slap. W-Y, are you slapping me? The daimyo asked with a swollen face. Because I want to kill you, but I want to give you another chance. As long as you accept a few conditions. He threatened him. Anything. Just don't kill me. Shuriken just took out a scroll and made him sign it. Use your whole palm to sign it. The daimyo didn't even read the scroll and signed it. It clearly said that he was submitting to a man named Shuriken Dama, the supreme daimyo of the world. That from now on, his authority will be under Shuriken, and he can be removed from office if he messes up. Shuriken didn't bother to tell him what was in it. In due time, he would know it. He folded the scroll and gave one copy to him. I, you are so young. How did you master all these elements? Mei inquired. Sure Sway and Tenken chuckled. Shuriken sighed. Don't be fooled by looks, young girl. My age is multiple times yours. Her eyes widened. Be but you looked so handsome. How can you be an old man? Shuriken frustratedly replied. Hey, who said I am an old man? Tell me. Would you call a whale that lives for 400 hundred years old? When it's just 100 years old? You mean your natural lifespan is too long? That's much harder to believe. Anyway, what's the plan? She asked cheerfully. It seemed she had wholeheartedly accepted Shuriken's identity with some doubts over his age. I judge her character right. Shuriken thought with his successful persuasion. Well... Zabuza here will create a distraction 
and lead all the Kirigakura shinobi outside. I will deal with them at once. Then we will find the Mizukage. He planned. Blink! Blink may looked at the brown-haired man. This man. He is Zabuza. Zabuza took down his wig and showed his real face. Bonk! Zabuza got smacked on his head by Shuriken. Who told you to take that off? We still have use for it. Hee <laughs> hee. Haku laughed, seeing Zabuza so helplessly being manhandled. Even Mei was startled to see how Zabuza was being treated. After that, they all left the palace and headed to Kirigakure. In the Daimyo's palace, now that Shuriken was gone, Daimyo took a sigh of relief. He took the scroll and read it slowly. His body started to sweat and shiver. This. What have I done? He realized the mess. You did the right thing. Now be a good servant to me. Do as I say, and you can live. Disobey, and this will happen to you. A voice resounded in the hall. Just then a root came out of the floor. The root enlarged and took the shape of Shuriken. It was the wood clone technique. Shuriken had seen Hashirama do it once in battle. It was a very convenient jutsu. The clones can be as simple in function as a wooden dummy for use in the body replacement technique or completely mobile and able to perform jutsu. They have the ability to travel far from the user and are able to communicate with the original. Moreover, since the wood clone has the ability to merge with plants and trees, it is also great for reconnaissance missions. Shuriken had left this one behind to do two things. One, to kill all the remaining nobles, except the daimyo, and keep the daimyo under control. I will be watching you. The clone warned him and slowly disappeared. Shuriken enjoyed the fact that his first mission was so successful. It sure was easy to bring the daimyo under my thumb. But this will likely not be the case with the remaining big countries water country was distant and not connected, so information does not travel fast. But the other countries were connected, and if he is not careful, the others will know about the oncoming threat of shuriken and try to save the daimyo with all their might, probably starting a full war. How are you going to take over the village? May asked him as they all headed to Kirigakure. It was not too far from their current location. As I told you before, Zabuza will make a distraction and lure all shinobi out of the village, where I will be waiting. I won't kill them, just make them fall unconscious. Shuriken planned. A.H. Grandpa, what will I be doing? Haku asked. Shuriken's eye twitched. Haku, you can call me Big Brother Shiro now, and your job will be to finish the healthy salad I will give you to eat. But, how will that help? Haku inquired in confusion. Of course, if you eat healthily, you will be stronger when you grow up, and it will in return help Kirigakure and me, Shuriken said, making Haku fall deep into thinking. May meanwhile was blushing and looking at his face. No matter how old he is, he's so hot. I wonder if he has a girlfriend, Lord Dama. How many people are in your family? May asked him. Shuriken shrugged. Well, the amazing nine bijou are obvious. I also have many more human family members. Cough, I meant blood-related family. She corrected her question. Hmm, I don't know. I never knew my parents. The bijou found me and raised me before I could even speak. Shuriken revealed. Sure sway and May understood one thing now. Shuriken was feeling how a child would feel if his parents were taken away from him. And in this case, they were enslaved. Thank God he didn't become angry and tried to take revenge on the entire shinobi world, Shursui's side, as he knew Shuriken's true power. Mei didn't know that, and she only felt sympathy for him. She would try to help him if it meant having a, a peaceful village. Are you going to take the bijou from each village? She asked. Shuriken didn't answer straightforwardly. The answer should be very obvious by now. It was indeed very obvious. They silently proceeded further. Slowly, they started to notice some mist surrounding them. And as they traveled further, the mist started to get thicker. Befitting to the name, the village was really hidden in the mist. I know a place for watching the village from a safe distance. 
There are many tall peaks around the village, May suggested, and took the lead. She made them circumvent the village border, and brought them on top of a very steep mountain. Little Haku was having trouble climbing it, so Shuriken had to carry him on his back. On the desolate and barren mountain, they stood there overlooking the village not too far. It was covered in mist, but Shuriken could see it clearly. He noted the architecture. Kirigakure's architecture was composed of several cylindrical buildings, with the Mizukage's office being the widest and largest. Most of the buildings had vegetation growing on their roofs. The people calmly walked on the streets, but there was this weird depressing aura around the whole village. It was as if there was no happiness. There was no hope. I can feel the cries of the people all the way from here, but these are the same people who killed the Yuki clan just out of fear. They have been brainwashed to hate, and to correct that, they need to be brainwashed to love again. He commented, How will you do that? May inquired. Shuriken shrugged, That's not my job. Whoever becomes the next Mizukage has to do it. All I can do is bring economic prosperity. But that will only last as long as they don't wage war with that money. Because if they do, I won't mind erasing a village. I have the authority anyway. Next. Who will be the next Mizukage? She asked. Whoever passes the test I will create. Go, Zabuza. Lure them out. It's time they see your pretty face. Shuriken pushed the man. He had worn his bandages once again. May on his side was thinking something else though. Can I also take the test? Shuriken nodded while keeping an eye on where Zabuza went. Sure, anybody can take it. Even our little Haku. But I won't be letting him stay here. It will be dangerous. He will be sent to my territory, where he will get the best education and lots of friends to play with. Where is this territory of yours? She asked. Haha, you have been asking me questions for so long, girl. Tell me about yourself, too. He diverted the topic. May started blushing and held her arms in the front, squeezing her breasts and making them pop up more. Well, I am single, 22 years old. You said 23 the last time. Sure, Sway interrupted. Hey, kids stay silent when adults talk. She barked. I'm 18, he replied. And all of a sudden, May's whole persona changed. Hee <laughs> hee, I was just joking. Yes, I am 23. But I look very young. My figure is 37-26-35. I am single, can sing very well, and also dance. She added. Shuriken chuckled. You are too horny, woman. You need to find yourself a man. That's what I am doing. She blurted in an instant, only to become shy next. Shuriken and Shursway were left shocked. This woman was too shameless. Only Tenken was laughing. Cough, Shuriken cleared his throat. He of course was attracted to the opposite gender, and Mei was absolutely stunning, but her age turned him off. He considered himself old, because he had lived for too long. So he at least hoped that if he ever got involved with someone, it'd be with an older woman and not a kid. Sure, Sway here is available. He's also from a very mighty clan, but I can't tell you the name yet. Shuriken threw Sure Sway under the cart. Sure Sway's brows twitched. Although he was wearing a blindfold, his frown was still visible. May check Sure Sway out. Hmm, he's blind, but he's proficient in fighting. He's also cute and tall. Hmm. He should have a decently big tool too. She decided to try him. She folded one arm under her boobs, lifting them up to show her cleavage. She extended one leg out of her long-sleeved, dark blue dress. Her mesh leggings became clearly visible, revealing her thick thighs. Then she lifted her other hand up and produced a small lava ball. So, what do you think about me? Wanna go out with me? Her charm was irresistible. Shuriken just looked to the other side, as her revealing body now made him feel things he had never before. But sure Sway looked left and right in confusion. What? What do you mean? What is she doing? Tenken laughingly answered. Wahaha? She is making a seductive pose, 
trying to make you horny. But I'm blind, Sher Sway blurted. May's arms fell immediately, and all her charm vanished. Her face turned dark. Damn it. How did I forget that so quickly? Am I too horny? I don't even know what you look like, Sher Sway added. Tenken helped him. Hmm, although I am a snake sage, I have seen many humans. And I can say, by human standards, she is very pretty. If I was a human, I would surely slither around and put some babies in her. May just stood there in awkwardness. Ah, uh, look. Zabuza seems to be returning. Where? There is nobody there. Shuriken asked her seriously. May felt like crying. These hopeless men. Can't they get a clue and just go with it? Ahaha. Ha. Then I was most likely seeing things. She replied. Boom. Now they're here. Take positions. Haku, you stay inside this hollow tree, okay? Shuriken alerted everyone. Haku obediently got in there. Shuriken had made sure to leave some holes for light to enter. From the look of it, Zabuza probably did something too big, because hundreds of shinobi were chasing him. Whoosh. What did you do? Shuriken asked curiously as Zabuza reached him. I killed the shinobi vice commander of the village while he was extorting money, Zabuza replied. Well, it worked. Are these all of them? Then let's put them to sleep. I shall use the mist and air itself. He decided. Natural transformation, wood grass. This was a simple attack. Out of nowhere. Small roots came out of the ground and held each shinobi in their place. Then Shuriken took a long breath in and blew out. It was an air element attack. The strong wind current was so great the shinobi couldn't even breathe oxygen. In a few minutes, all of them started falling unconscious. That's one thing done. Let's go to the village now. Shuriken announced. Watch out. Shursue suddenly jumped. He pulled Meiturumi back with one hand and stopped a barrage of Shuriken. Shuriken sighed. He was testing Mei's capabilities, but Shursue was too on edge it seemed. Earth style. Earthly pole. This technique involved making the top layer of the soil move and bringing the enemy closer to oneself. It was easier when combined with the wood grass, holding the enemy in place. Doing this, Shuriken pulled this enemy closer to question him. Cough. I know my body is irresistible, but can you let go? May sounded. Her face was flushed red. Sure Sway felt something on his palm. He squeezed it a little. It was very soft and warm. Then it took him three seconds to realize what it was. A.H. I am sorry, I didn't mean to. His face also turned red. Shuriken chuckled after seeing the two. Haha. -ha. Youth. They remind me of Jean and Minari back in the days. Tenken agreed. Yeah, they do. But what are you saying, my lord? Your long lifespan probably puts you in your late teenage years right now. It does, but we need to remember, not everyone is like me. Alright, let's see who this ninja is. Shuriken sighed and focused on the task at hand. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.